The hour of 10 o'clock having arrived, we'll call to order the September 24, excuse me, the September 10th, 2024 meeting of the Santa Cruz City Council and the clerk will call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. Council Members Newsom? Present. Brown? Here. Watkins? Here. Bruner? Is currently absent. Kalantari Johnson? Present. Vice Mayor Golder? Here. And Mayor Keeley? Here. A quorum having been established and Council Member Bruner is present. Uh, we will uh, go to statement of disqualification. Anyone who has a statement of disqualification they need to announce at this point, Ms. Brown. I don't have anything on closed session, but I do have um, on item 14. Just in closed session right now. Very good. Everybody good on closed session? Very good. Uh, this would be the opportunity for the public, excuse me, <coughs> excuse me, the, uh, for the public to comment on any of our closed session items, which are items one, two, three, and four on our closed session agenda today. This would be the opportunity to comment on those. Do we have anyone online, Ms. Bush? We do not, no. Okay, anyone in chambers? Seeing and hearing none. Uh, we will adjourn into closed session. We will return from closed session no earlier than 11.30 a.m. And at this point, we stand adjourned into closed session. The hour of 11.30 having arrived and the City Council having completed its business in closed session, I will call this meeting of the City Council to order and the clerk will call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. Council Member Newsom? Present. Brown? Here. Watkins? Is currently absent. Bruner? Present. Kalantari Johnson? Present. Vice Mayor Golder? Here. Mayor Keeley? Here. And Council Member Watkins is present. We are on oral communication. This would be the opportunity for anyone to address the City Council on a matter under our jurisdiction, but not on today's agenda for a period of time not to exceed two minutes. We will start with folks who are here in Council Chambers. If we have folks who call in online, we will alternate between in-person and online. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, my name is Ann Simonton. I'm with the Commission for the Prevention of Violence Against Women. And it is with heavy heart that I come today because I really want to teach um, trauma-informed investigative techniques to our Santa Cruz Police Department. And I see this as an immediate and necessary uh, thing to do in terms of, of victims' advocacy. The commission is, is uh, supposed to be doing, helping make sure trainings happen. We've been neglectful in that. We have not done that for the six years I've been on. Uh, we've, it's been pushed over to victim advocate, who's one person who works overtime and, you know, has lots of jobs to do. So um, my <clears throat> encouragement is that we take serious the fact that recently the Santa Cruz uh, chief of police, Bernie Escalante, stated very clearly that using abusive language was okay. And that abusive language is, how many times did the rapist thrust inside of you? And this was shown by the police department to somehow share the, the amount of, the length of time that an assault would take. This to me is egregious, it's prurient. It takes a victim right back to the visceral action of the rape. It's, it's a very sad situation. <clears throat> I want to remind everyone here that the commission began in 1981 because of abusive language by the Santa Cruz Police Department. I was around <laughs> during that time. And so I just encourage you all to please take note, to please make certain that this uh, change can happen, and that uh, you look at also conflicts of interest that could be going on within our uh, commission, because they are real and they were vibrant during that particular explanation of his bravado that he used and complete assurance that this was a terrific thing to ask. Thank you very much. Anyone else on oral communication? Anyone online, Ms. Bush? We'll take the person online. Good morning. Welcome to the city council meeting. 
person online. Good morning. Yes. Uh, hello. Hey, as a taxpayer and an ideological critic, critic of what routinely are the council action items that display total disregard for cherished American principles and the total disregard for fiduciary ethics involving taxpayer money, I once again feel betrayed over last meeting's approval of a project labor agreement study for $176,000 submitted by the mayor and his followers. What I mean is funding this PLA study through municipal utility monopoly receipts such as the water, sewer, and refuse, using such monies not to provide utility services at cost, but as a slush fund to be coercively forced on ratepayers without any real relationship to actually providing utility assets uh, or services as a basis, shows me you have the principles of abusive authoritarian pilferers. Doing a feasibility study tells me your intent is once again to use a paid third-party gaslighting justifier to implement a PLA, which is an outrageously expensive waste of money, and I bet produces a biased report trying to justify the unjustifiable, at least by American principles, while vacating your fiduciary responsibilities by not using simple critical reasoning, instead with a simple examination of the summary effects of such past agreements elsewhere where they're not very good. The ultimate idea is to discriminate against non-union contractors and assign privilege to union contractors in an anti-competitive environment that surely will net uh, taxpayers costing more and reducing bidding by hiring firms with a higher cost basis than non-union uh, union contractors uh, with the lame excuse suggesting only unions can offer apprentice programs, which conveniently for them increases their member ranks. Perhaps it's also good for buying union votes with public money, but destroying the individual rights of non-union contractors who also hire apprentices and indeed violating the individual right of people to join a union or to not join a union. You must be, think people are stupid and cannot make these decisions for themselves, and the government must control every aspect of people's lives. Thanks. Thank you. Anyone else on oral communication? Good morning. Welcome to the council meeting, Mr. Ewing. Yeah, good morning. Wow, three minutes. How did that happen? Two minutes. Uh, not, two minutes. Okay, whatever. <laughs> um, you know, it's really kind of interesting. I was at the supervisor's meeting earlier. My name's James Ewing Whitman. And... Uh, one knows how to take the initiative, they can usually speak first. You know, it's amazing that room was overflowing and the whole hallway outside was overflowing when it said, stand to the Pledge of Allegiance. I didn't look around, but I, since I was in the front, I know I wasn't standing to the corporate maritime pirate flag. Recently learned why it was in 1783 that our constitutional republic was destroyed. So we have, you know, what do we have? Six different legal jurisdictions going on, and, you know, the elected officials were elected by members of the public to hopefully follow through with what the public wishes them to do, where I'm not sure what kind of actual powers the elected supervisors or the council members have under a charter city or county. Um, I was going to make a joke. I probably won't. I did write you two weeks ago. I won't. So I find myself uh, somehow taking 17 units at Cabrillo. It's actually quite challenging to just be forced to read, then take a break, and then just read more. A friend posted a very interesting article, probably took me 25 minutes to read, and it had to do with the explosion of autism in Western nations, particularly in the United States and in Canada, where the CDC, I could be more flavorful with Center for Disease Creation, um, is saying that right now, 2024, right, right now, 2024, it's saying it's one in 28 children, when there's other facts saying it's one in eight, and in 2030, one and two. Quite scary. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ewing. We have another person online. We'll take the person online, then we'll be right with you. Person online, good morning. Welcome to the City Council meeting. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Richard Wilson, speaking in behalf of a good brother I minister to at the St. George Hotel, who received the tragic letter from Barron Ranch uh, rental provider for the St. George Hotel that he and 69 other uh, patrons at the St. George will be seeing a fourth excuse, fold. Excuse, 
excuse me for just a moment. I believe you may want to be commenting on item 30 on our regular agenda today. Um, and so I think what I'll do is ask you to call back in when we are on item 30. And item 30, I'll be happy to wait. Your concerns at that time. Thank you so much. Next person online, good morning. Good morning, can you hear me? Great. Yes. The city continues to refer to the terrorism of homeless folks or sweeps as encampment resolutions. Those living outdoors call those sweeps raids. I would like to paint a picture for those listening at home as well as the city council members for how little support is actually offered before people's property is thrown in dump trucks never to be seen again. Vacant orders can be given within two weeks or how, but however, there are often as short as five days or 24 hours to move everything you own. I know not a single city council member could move, personally move all of their belongings in five days, much less 24 hours. To make it worse, a high percentage of our house neighbors are disabled and have to move everything without access to a moving truck or a destination to go. The city council will tell you that everyone at these encampments are offered a shelter. This is a lie. The outreach team walks past many people asking for help and tells others that they are banned from all shelters because of a mistake they made years ago. A few times, outward reach or worker Jeremy has promised to schedule someone a ride at an armory shelter. The person waits all night at the designated pickup spot. The van never arrives. And then all of their property is destroyed the following day by police or city workers. Sergeant Ross, who leads the encampment raids, can be heard threatening arrest throughout the process, calling people liars as he makes fun of them for not finding a place to move yet. Smirking, he says, oh, it's you again. Violent arrests are common without reason given. Citation, criminalization, punishment, and the displacement reinforces isolation and destroys the communities that unhoused people have to develop to keep themselves and each other safe. There is not enough room at the shelters here in Santa Cruz to accommodate the homeless population. The council is lying when they said everyone is offered shelter. Stop the sweeps. Thank you. Anyone <coughs> else online? Good afternoon, excuse me, good morning, welcome. Good morning. I have copies of a paper that I've already sent to all of you, but I have received no responses. Although Sandy Brown and Sonia, last city council meeting, you asked for a follow up and asked for my email, but neither of you have responded. So I do have paper copies. But more importantly, I want to talk if about water. Kind of, if you'd be kind enough to give that to yeah. the clerk, then she will be pleased to distribute. Thank you so much. I want to talk about water. In the beginning of this year, the homeless people taking refuge at Harvey West suffered from a serious Shigella outbreak. Shigella causes dysentery symptoms, and the disease is spread through unclean water. Santa Cruz City responded by shutting off the only safe drinking water fountain at that park. Of course, that made the outbreak worse. Then, they sweeped Harvey West with a raid of over 12 police officers on April 29th. Then, they put up fences that protected Friendship Park from anybody entering it, so that doesn't seem right. This is not encampment resolution. It's an encampment raid and destruction. It's unacceptable. But this city has actually a pattern of removing drinkable water as a way to punish poor and homeless people. This year, citizens may have noticed there's no longer any drinking fountains downtown. Travis Beck of Parks and Recreation ordered the removal of all drinking fountains downtown as a part of redesigning the downtown area. From a public records request, I learned that in November, Sonia Bruner, thank you, you asked why the removal of free water. Travis Beck answered that instead of replacing the 30-year-old drinking fountains, they'll just remove them. But the connections will remain, and they can be reinstalled. I demand the city works to reinstall drinking fountains downtown for everyone. Free water is life-saving for some, and it is useful for all of us. Reinstall drinking fountains downtown and stop the sweep. Good morning. Welcome. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, oh, silly hat, sorry. Um, put it back on, yeah. No, you're, uh, you can wear it, Fred, if you like. Um, <laughs> I, uh, yeah, it's for tips. So I do ballooning down, uh, you know, un unpermitted. I got a $250 ticket I need to speak to you about. Um, uh, so 10% uh, of the land area of the county uh, burned up four years ago. And uh, there's a lot of uh, fallow land up there, people who aren't rebuilding um, don't feel uh, comfortable living in that zone. Uh, I feel like uh, getting, talking, interfacing with the county and some of these uh, fifth district uh, supervisor candidates about um, opening some of the campsites up 236 uh, uh, out of Boulder Creek towards Big Basin or other places. I mean, they, they started, they turned uh, uh, the uh, Tamerlane uh, 
Tamerlane Village, or uh, it was like a hotel and cabins since they turned it into a, a vet's village, and that, that's been very successful, I believe. Um, I'm watching that, uh, uh, I'm watch I live in that district, uh, I'm watching that race very carefully. Uh, Christopher Bradford is a very, uh, a very uh, upstanding uh, business owner, and uh, uh, I, feel like, uh, I feel like he's a more appropriate choice for the district. I, I plan to vote for him and support him um, uh, unequivocally. Um, many of uh, the residents of the city of Santa Cruz are actually in the 5th district. If they don't know that, that's uh, between, uh, say, Harvey West and uh, and uh, over towards, uh, say, Market off of uh, off of uh, Water Street there, like that zone. Um, I have 18 seconds to talk about how ridiculous uh, two cent per fluid ounce tax on sugary SODAs. We don't want the kids having an SODA, do we? Um, that's almost twice the price of like your most basic. Uh, carbonated beverage. If it were two percent, it'd be much cheaper. Thank you, sir. <coughs> good morning. Welcome. Uh, good morning, Mayor and, and Council. Everybody. Um, I am uh, Greg Bankson. I uh, I'm a registered voter in Santa Cruz, and uh, I am currently living in the parking lot over at the library, which is um, not my ideal thing. Um, I've got funding for an apartment, and just waiting for the right spot. Um, other people might not have that opportunity to be snap put somewhere, um, but we, we who are unhoused, um, you know, we're people exist in space and time, and uh, but we need a space to exist. And being constantly seeing what happens to my friends who have already been traumatized since the day they were born, some of them in horror stories, seeing them repeatedly traumatized by just trying to figure out, well, where do I go? They don't even talk back to the cops. They just they just sit there crying. I get to see them crying for three hours. <clears throat> but Santa Cruz is a place of possibility and and miracles. And you know we need to expect miracles. We got to create them. And we have the we've got the resources. And if you tap into the minds, just a part a portion of the minds of my friends that are unhoused, part of those minds stay away. But um. There's miraculous information there. I know there's miraculous information here. So just look at people as people, all of us. Peace. Thank you, sir. Good morning. Welcome. Thank you. All of you. <laughs> I'm Richard. I'm not rich. I'm a community organizer, and I know many of you that I haven't been my word to meet with you. Today I was at the county. One union, SEIU, we're ready to strike. I'm not ready to strike. I want to invite all of you, uh, particularly our mayor. We've been working with Fred Keeley for a long time. I want to keep plan A. We're going to focus on Cabrillo, one of 1,200 community colleges. Their student government meets this Thursday on any of you. Get some people to empower where less than 100 people voted with all that money and all our unions. Now, I'm open to having anybody on this city council know that we could have a youth mayor and a youth city council and take that aid so it links up to UC, as particularly as Fred, you mentioned, it's not a city issue that we have to solve. It's a solving with partnership with the county. Check out the publicity that came from this morning. Now, those who want my full name, I am Richard Lewis. I'm proud to be part of a family that most of you know. My younger brother sold 40,000 BWs. I want no money. I want you to see me as you might, somebody homeless. So, thank you for the listening. I will be, my, I can't even do but get up in the morning and go to sleep. I am dealing with cancer because that's where I can't even remember now at my age, senior moments or whatever. So this city manager has a lawyer. Go and see how many lawyers could get behind what Ted wants to do. A for-profit company that puts its profit back to student government. For you, get somebody there representing you on Thursday. 
Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Mr. Lewis. Good morning, sir. Welcome. Yeah, my name is Lee Brokaw. I think I know most of you. Um, I'm going to talk about the water department. Um, I got one of those newfangled water meters that communicates directly with the city without having to send somebody out to read it. I really didn't need it. My water meter was just fine. And then I got a notice about how much it was going to cost to read my meter by driving by. So I said, okay, go ahead and change it. So about 10 days ago, I went out and there were some clowns from the water department out there digging up my landscape, throwing their tools on top of my Cianosa, and digging a big hole. And I said, well, what's going on? Well, we got to put a big meter box here in case we have to work on your, your meter. So they tore up my landscape and they put this huge box in. And I said, well, why have you chosen to do that at my address? Well, we're doing it everywhere in the city. Well, as soon as they were finished with mine, they didn't go to my neighbors. They left. They didn't go onto my block and start at one corner, go all the way to the other corner, come across, go all the way to the other corner, and do our entire block. They did just mine. Now, I'm sure none of you would have sent them just because I come and complain. <laughs> but I'm sure you folks need to know how the water department is not working properly. As a contractor, if I approached my work that way, I'd be out of business. And I notice my water rates are going up. Maybe this is why. Anyone else online, Ms. Bush? No one online, last call in terms of uh, oral communication. We are on item number uh, five. This is a mayoral proclamation declaring September as Service Dog Awareness Month. I've asked Council Member Newsom if he would be kind enough to make this presentation. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so service dogs play an integral role in enhancing the quality of life for individuals with disabilities and medical conditions. Uh, these remarkable animals are specially trained to perform a wide range of tasks that help mitigate the limitations faced by people with disabilities, including assisting with mobility, providing alert and medical response, and promoting a great sense of independence. Service dogs are also trained to navigate public spaces, ensuring safe passage for their handlers, and are highly skilled at remaining uh, focused and calm and busy in busy and sometimes stressful environments. Service dogs have demonstrated their invaluable contributions in various fields, such as guiding individuals with visual impairments, alerting individuals with diabetes to rapid shifts in blood glucose, alerting people with, higher, with hearing impairments to important sounds, assisting those with physical disabilities and everyday tasks, offering support to individuals with psychiatric conditions, and aiding veterans and first responders in their post-traumatic recovery. And these incredible animals not only provide practical assistance, but also offer unconditional love and companionship, improving the overall well-being and mental health of their, of their handlers. So Service Dog Awareness Month provides an opportunity to recognize and appreciate the dedication, hard work, and incredible impact of service dogs, as well as the trainers, organizations, and individuals who contribute to their training, care, and support. And raising awareness about service dogs helps dispel misconceptions, increase understanding, and foster acceptance within our community, ensuring that the rights and access of individuals with disabilities and their service dogs are respected and protected. And in honor of service dogs and all that they do, I, Scott Newsom, on behalf of Mayor Keeley, do hereby proclaim the month of September 2024 as Service Dog Awareness Month in the city of Santa Cruz and encourage all citizens, organizations, businesses, and schools to participate in events and initiatives that raise awareness, promote education, and celebrate the extraordinary contribution of service dogs in our community. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Is Ms. Kleck here? Please come forward. And uh, the council member will present you with the proclamation. We would love to hear a couple of words from you, or more, perhaps more than a couple, <laughs> five or six even. Good morning. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. Sure. Yeah, thank you so much for accepting my um, recommendation to declare uh, September as National Service Dog Month in Santa Cruz. It's, I've had a service dog for 13 years now. This is my second. 
She is trained to alert me for low and high blood sugars, and she has saved my life, my life numerous times. Um, a few, many years ago, about 10 years ago, uh, myself and my mom were doing a, a push in Santa Cruz to um, raise awareness in restaurants. I know that we have a big problem with a lot of pets being told, but being, being used as fake service dogs. So having the city recognize um, September as National Service Dog Month is, is very helpful for that awareness. So thank you. Well, thank you so much. Best wishes to you. Thank you. Thank you. We are on item number six. This is a mayoral proclamation declaring September also as Childhood Cancer Awareness Month, and I have asked our vice mayor if she would make this presentation. Is there somebody here from Jacob's Heart? Jacob's Heart. Heart? Want to come on up? Thank you. Thank you for being here today um, to accept this proclamation. Uh, one of my best friends lost her nephew to childhood cancer about a year, just over a year ago, and I know it affects people um, all over the country and so and the world. I'd like to read um, from this proclamation. So, um, each year, nearly 19 out of every 100,000 children in our community will be diagnosed with cancer. And whereas cancer remains the leading cause of death and disease among children, more than asthma, diabetes, cystic fibrosis, congenial abnormalities, and AIDS combined. And whereas Jacob's Heart Cancer Support Services has been keeping medically fragile children and families housed, fed, and emotionally supported by steadfastly adhering to the following commitments. One, parents of children with cancer and other serious illnesses will be relieved from financial fears and able to focus their attention on their children. Two, no child undergoing intense treatment in our community will be homeless. Three, the, um, three, uh, I think it was three. No, oh, three, families of serious, um, ill children will not experience food insecurities during and after, and four, no seriously ill child in our community will ever miss a medical appointment because of lack of transportation. And so um, it's important for all Santa Cruz residents to recognize the impact of pediatric cancer on the families within the community and honor the children in our community whose lives have been cut short by cancer. And so now, therefore, I, Renee Golder, on behalf of our mayor and council, uh, do hereby proclaim the month of September 2024 as Childhood Cancer Awareness Month in the city of Santa Cruz and encourage all citizens to join me in honoring Jacob's Heart Children's Cancer Support Services for its 26 years of outstanding support to our community. Thank you. Good morning, welcome, thank you for all of your very fine work. Thank you. Uh, my name is Jacob. Um, I am here on behalf of Jacob's Heart. I just wanted to thank the mayor and the council for proclamating September as Childhood uh, Cancers Awareness Month and the continued support for the families in our community that have children with cancer. Um, I just wanted to quickly state a couple of so August has been our busiest month on record um, with our services. And as of right now, we're serving 322 families in our community. And we have, what is it, about 1,100 individuals in our programs. And just in August, we uh, provided about 200 rides to and from the hospital or doctor's appointment in our community. So I just wanted to say thank you for your support and we'll just keep uh, helping the families as much as we can. So thank you. God love you. Thank you. We are on item seven. This is a national emergency preparedness month. We will hear from Meredith Albert, a principal management analyst or we may hear from other persons as well. <laughs> Here we go, great, great, come on. Hello, how are you today? 
Hello, Mayor. Uh, yeah. Mayor Keeley, yeah. Vice Mayor Golder, City Council members, City staff. Thank you for having us here today. Oh, certainly. Um, I'm Division Chief Shields, uh, Division Chief of Prevention, so this is something that I work in every day. Um, I apologize. Thank you. Uh, so this month is, na we're recognizing National Preparedness Month, um, and Meredith has a fantastic presentation that she'll go through. Um, as we know, the city of Santa Cruz is not immune to our fair share of disasters and emergencies, as we've seen over the last several years with fires and floods, and for those of us who can remember even earthquakes back in 1989. So, um, As we move forward, we were fortunate enough to bring on Meredith Albert, who came to us from the city of Cupertino as their emergency operation um, assistant manager. She is our manager of Office of Emergency Services here, and she's a lovely individual and has brought a lot of great attributes to the fire department as well as the city. So if you get a chance to talk with her one-on-one, -on -one, it's fantastic. She really worked <clears throat> in Cupertino to establish um, emergency evacuation plans and maps, and she's doing the same thing for us and has already posted to our public site two ways out, and she'll get into that further. So. I know that we are blessed to have her with uh, the city. We are super lucky to have her. And don't fret, because Fire will be back next month for another presentation for Fire <laughs> Prevention Week. But without further ado, I'll turn it over to Meredith. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Albert, welcome. Thank you. And thank you for the kind words, Chief Shields. September is getting crowded. <laughs> It's also, today is World Suicide Prevention Day, and I think it's National Ants on a Log Day, if anyone was wondering. Um, I'm here to speak about National Preparedness Month. Um, I wanted to start by thanking you all for your time and the opportunity to speak and your ongoing commitment to our community's uh, safety and resilience in light of increasingly frequent and more severe disasters. As Tim said, I'm, I'm Meredith Albert. I came from the city of Cupertino. Prior to that, the county of Contra Costa. And I'm thrilled to be here. Um, I've had nothing but good experience with your city staff and our coordinating public safety partners. Um, and I've, I've really been impressed by the size of the city and the commitment to public service that I'm seeing on the part of the staff. So today we'll talk a little bit about emergency preparedness. We'll talk about evacuation planning briefly. I'll highlight the role of community engagement, and everything we talk about needs to include an equity lens. So it presents an ongoing challenge, but also an opportunity to engage with our community in a different way. Yikes. I promise this isn't all bad news. Uh, so disasters are increasing in frequency and severity for the city of Santa Cruz, also for the state of California, the country, and the world. We see changing precipitation patterns, climate change, sea level rise, and increasingly um, social instability and threats of violence. Um, the good news is that we learn from every disaster, and we adapt and refine our plans as we go along, and we're getting really good at refining those plans here in Santa Cruz and up and down the California coast. The other good news is that we have a community that is increasingly savvy to what the threats are, what their vulnerabilities are, and they're engaged. They want to be engaged. They reach out. Um, some have really interesting ideas, um, all of which, even, even the ideas that don't fly, demonstrate a level of engagement that I think is really um, heartening and will lend itself to resilience. When I talk about resilience, I'm talking about the ability to recover from and rebuild after an event with as close to a level of pre-event um, stability as possible, understanding that that might not always be 100%. Um, so what do we do? We plan. We get together and we talk. Um, we emphasize planning in terms of having a plan, making a kit, staying informed, and getting to know your neighbors. Uh, these four steps are critical, and I recognize that they're not equally accessible to all members of our community, right? We have people for whom these things are just out of reach. They might not have the extra supplies to build a kit. They might not receive information in the language that it's disseminated in. Um, they might not be able to act on the information for our community members who don't have access to transportation. So we have a very diverse community, and our planning efforts are tailored to that diversity 
and continue to grow, continue to adapt, and continue to be refined. We're never going to be done. There's no point at which I'm going to deliver you a plan that's going to save everyone in the city and prevent all disaster. Um, but what I can do is learn as much as we possibly can about the community and build a plan that gives everyone sort of an equitable chance at surviving and thriving. So when we talk about emergencies increasing in frequency and severity, we talk about community engagement and preparedness, uh, evacuation planning deserves some attention. Uh, this is a time of year as we look forward to fire season and think about winter storms where we know that parts of our community are disproportionately vulnerable, either because of the residents or because of the threat profile that they live within. So the boardwalk, low-lying areas, uh, the communities that we have that are adjacent to the wildland urban interface up in the higher elevations, um, and all of the communities, that the, the entire community that's vulnerable to things like poor air quality and power outages, even if they're not in a high fire threat zone, we are all seeing impacts at different times, sometimes layered upon one another. So when we talk about evacuation, we also talk about sheltering in place, understanding that it's increasing, it's in incredibly unlikely that we will ever evacuate the entire city of Santa Cruz. The same mechanisms, the same tools and principles we use to issue evacuation warnings and alerts are also used to issue life-saving, life-safety shelter-in-place information. So we're talking about evacuation planning, but we're also talking about the ability to give people information they need to stay home and stay safe. Uh, I promise it's not all doom and gloom. Um, evacuation planning, we're talking about flood maps, tsunami maps, and high wildfire threat severity zones. So these three maps guide our planning efforts and help us prioritize outreach and evacuation plans in communities that are impacted by one of these three areas. Excuse me. These are the three most likely hazards to cause an evacuation. In most other types of events, it is uh, safer to keep people at home and to provide them life safety information at home. So a fast-moving wildfire, a flood, or a tsunami, those are exceptions to the rules. And again, we're unlikely to evacuate the entire community at once. When we talk about these three threat profiles, um, we are working with our public safety partners, both at the city level and at the county level um, and at the state level, to understand, like, for example, where our tsunami inundation zone has expanded since 2009, where our wildfire threat has increased since 2010, 2012, um, everything we do to our built environment adjusts the way we're vulnerable to threats. So none of these threats are static. We have a constantly evolving landscape, which again leads to constantly evolving and adaptable plans. Getting down to the nuts and bolts of evacuation planning, we in the city comprise 31 evacuation zones. These are part of the larger county area that includes more evacuation zones. In the city, we now have 31 evacuation zone maps uploaded and available for residents to download on the city website. We developed these maps in coordination with our law enforcement partners and the city communications officer. Um, the maps are intended to be used as a strategic planning tool by residents. These are not intended to guide people and show them the exact way out in any disaster, given that every disaster is different and the evacuation route will be prescribed by the incident commander in an incident requiring evacuation. Excuse me. So these tools are intended really to communicate to residents that there is more than one way in every zone in the city to leave. They're also designed to encourage registration for crews aware our proactive life safety alert and warning tool, um, and to encourage people to look and see. Even those residents who don't have access to individual cars or might be at work when an evacuation is ordered should get familiar with the evacuation maps at their home, at their work, at the place their children go to school, or their elderly parents live, in my case. Um, you want to know what the potentials are for every address that means something to you. Um, when you register for CruiseAware, and this is a message I hope that you all help me push out to the community, you can register to receive information from more than one address in more than one modality. So you can be texted alerts, emailed, 
uh, phone calls. Um, and we will use these messages in combination wi with wireless emergency alerts and IPAWS, the federal systems, as needed based on the incident and thresholds. Um, but there's no point at which if we don't have your name in that registry, you will receive the most accurate and up-to-date information. We'll come back to that point in a moment when we review evacuation map feedback. So these maps were posted online in July, toward the end of June, um, along with a solicitation for feedback from residents, understanding that when I've done this in the past, if people can't read the maps, I'm doing something wrong. Um, and frequently, people can't read the maps. Um, the good news is that everyone who responded to the survey so far, and it is a small sample size, it's something like 53 people, uh, see more than one way out. So the maps are legible, and people who uh, use this tool are seeing that there's more than one way to leave. Most zones in the city have at least one respondent, with a few exceptions. Um, people are engaging. The bad news, or the less good news maybe, is that uh, only 52% of our respondents have registered to receive alerts through Cruise Aware. Mm. So we need to do some more outreach. <clears throat> um, for those people who aren't registered, um, many of them plan on using social media to get emergency public information, which is not a bad thing if it's used in conjunction with an official source of information. It can be a bad thing if it's exclusively if it is the exclusive source of information you're getting about an event. So what this feedback tells me is that we need to revise. As I revise, the next iteration of these maps will include mass transit staging areas, in particular downtown areas, um, and opportunities for paratransit vans to reach staging areas. These are both areas that uh, residents are understandably concerned about, particularly residents who live in the downtown areas or uh, work in places where their cars might be in a parking garage while they're at work. Um, even without those locations on maps, we're using the maps to really encourage people at outreach events to talk to their coworkers and talk to their neighbors and their family. Uh, you can begin to plan even without knowing those staging areas, and when we put staging areas on maps, they are subject to change. So before I close out, I want to return one more time to equity, because everything we do in emergency management disproportionately, um, or rather I should say disasters, will disproportionately impact the most vulnerable members of our community. We know this, we have known this, it will continue to be true, and we are going to do everything we can to mitigate that inequity. And what that means is communicating in as many different ways with as many different sections of our population as we can. Um, to that end, I need your help. I'm relatively new to this position. You all know the communities you represent far better than I do. Um, those unique vulnerabilities and unique communication needs, please share them with me. And please share with your communities the need to register for Cruise Aware and to understand the differences between an evacuation warning and an evacuation order. We have this idea, this impression, I think, in emergency management that if we all have a go kit, we're ready. Um, and that's not the case. We have community members who have livestock or are sole caregivers for vulnerable, dependent adult children, are elderly, don't have cars, et cetera. Um, all of them need to be included, even if that's just being part of the conversation for now. Um, so I need your help in that. Thank you, presenter, title, first name, and last name. If anyone has any questions, I would love to engage with you and uh, provide clarification as needed. Ms. Albert, thank you very much. Let me see if there are questions by council members. Council member Brown is recognized. I have a quick comment and a question, um, which I know the answer to, but I want to have everyone hear it. I just want to say thank you. Uh, this is, uh, it's wonderful to hear from you. Welcome. So glad to um, have you on board and the way that you framed the importance of our response network and, and the role we can play was really helpful. Um, so my question is, how, I was surprised that only 52% of folks were signed up for, for Cruise Aware. It's really easy to do. And so if you could just share how people could do that. Um, for anyone who's listening. Cruiseaware.com. There you go. Um, I was also <laughs> surprised. I think it was particularly um, sort of disappointing because I assume that the people who 
take the time to respond to that poll are among the most engaged in our community. And for there to be only 52% of those people registered, I think there may be some misinformation about um, pre-existing systems and sort of legacy registrations. If you're not sure whether you're registered, create another registration. It certainly can't hurt. And we live in a time where people are exhausted by the number of subscriptions and outreach information they might get by sharing their email or phone number. I promise you that you will not receive unnecessary communication. If you never receive an alert, that's good news. If you do receive an alert, you need to act on it. Yeah. I, I want to just really quickly, if I could, say um, absolutely. I'm signed up. You know, I have learned about the importance of this, and um, you know, there. And I know that the the systems have transitioned, and that there has been some confusion. So please, everybody, go sign up. Uh, and um, you do not. And I can I can say I get very few. Um, rep uh, messages and you can tailor it too so that you um, really are only getting messages about you know extreme emergencies if you don't want to get the other um, messages so it, it really is streamlined easy and um, super important thank you see if there are the council members council member Bruner big comment thank you so much uh, since you last presented at our public safety committee meeting um, <clears throat> to really emphasize the multiple addresses, I think is huge for um, everyone to not associate emergency preparedness with a home and to think about multiple places where one might be or that means something to them, uh, family, schools, place of work. Um, and especially, thank you, it was great to see some of the updates in terms of staging areas, especially the transit options for unsheltered or seniors that are not able to really access some of those preparedness resources and tools. Thank you. That was, um, we really appreciate having you. Thank you. Other council members? Seeing here, none. Thank you for your presentation. Very much appreciated. Uh, Thank you. We, uh, we will see you on a future occasion, I suspect. Thank you very much. We're on item eight. This is a West Cliff project update. Our public works director, Mr. Nguyen, is going to make this presentation. Good afternoon, sir, and thank you to your team for all of your very good work. Good afternoon, Mayor, uh, City Council members of the public. I'm Nathan Nguyen, director of public works. I'm going to pull up our uh, slide deck right now. So today I'm here to give you guys a relatively brief update on the number of uh, projects that are occurring uh, along West Cliff. Uh, again, we've uh, had some historic, thank you, uh, events uh, over the past two winters with regards to the damage that has sustained. But we wanted to give uh, you as well as the public an update on as far as where we're at with some of the projects. So today I'll go over the damages uh, that we had sustained in, in 23 and 24, and we'll talk about the order of recovery that has uh, taken place over the last 18 to 20 months. Uh, notice in this photo here too, you'll see this is really the 800 site is what we're calling it, uh, the 800 block of Westcliff. Uh, and right there you can see down on the uh, shoreline there, a, uh, I guess it's a wharf piling uh, from the, when the recent storm damages. Okay, so this image, is, this image uh, provides really an a overview of the damages that occurred in 2023 as well in 2024. Uh, this has been utilized over the past 18 months, but we've updated it as we've gone through different funding sources as well as adding new sites. In particular, uh, I think this site, this particular image includes uh, pathway damage at the 1100 site, which is what we're also calling David Way. I'll get into a little bit more of those details about uh, that site, but. What I want to highlight here is that we have 11 sites that are actively under uh, essentially construction, design, or permitting uh, that we're working through funding on. Uh, <clears throat> it's limited to do uh, a lot of the staff resourcing that we have as far as the amount of work that we can actually get accomplished out there. And so again, the order of recovery is kind of prioritized in some of those most uh, exposed areas. The rough cost at this point for the number of sites, these 11 repair sites that we're working on, is about $28 million. 
uh, with a local match, we're roughly saying around 11%, so about you know, almost $3 million of local funds goes to support both the federal and state funding that we received thus far. Okay, so the first uh, block that we'll go over is the 900 block. Uh, this, is, this is an image of both 920 and 932. Uh, these infill walls were constructed uh, earlier uh, this year. Uh, they're essentially near complete. Uh, what we're waiting on at this point on both of these sites is galvanized railing to protect the public uh, from the edge there. And then you can see in between these two walls, there's some space where uh, we have some dirt that's exposed at this point, and we've working with a local ecologist, uh, Bill Henry, on determining some, uh, some native restoration that can go in this location. And that'll also be included as a part of our mitigation efforts when we talk about going for a full coastal development permit, as well as some of the other permits with NOAA and Fish and Wildlife, et cetera. So uh, you can see the cost there. We expect we've been waiting for this galvanized railing, I think, for three or four months now. Uh, but we do hope to get it in in this uh, upcoming week. So uh, as, as that gets installed and some of the native restoration is, work is underway, the temporary traffic control that you see and have experienced for the past year will continue to remain out there as I talk about these additional sites next. So while we were excited about to see the infill walls get constructed uh, over the past year, uh, unfortunately during the 24 storms, we received additional damage on the 900 block. So these two images are just west of the 920 and 932 sites. Uh, the 944 sinkhole uh, is in the construction staging area as we speak. Um, it has been filled, so we're happy to announce that the work is occurring out there where the sinkhole itself has been filled. There's additional work with regards to uh, protecting the bottom half of the uh, existing retaining wall at 944, uh, as well as uh, at 960, which is really the end of the existing retaining wall. We had some additional failures that occurred there. This has been a little bit more of a challenging situation where we're looking at, as you can see in the photo there, uh, the path uh, is starting to erode right underneath the path there. The design team uh, is working collaboratively with a um, coastal commission on the design. It's going to be a hybrid type of wall where it'll be gravity in one section with a secant wall as you move further west. Next, we'll go over the 1,000 block of West Cliff. So uh, 1016, I'll start there. The 1016 infill wall was one of the sites that had sustained the most damage in the January 23, uh, 2023 event. Uh, we immediately put emergency protective measures out there and deemed that site as priority one. So that 1016 wall has essentially been constructed and is waiting for the galvanized railing similar to the 920 and 932 sites. Uh, next to that, we have the Bethany, Curve, uh, or Be Bethany Culvert Project. Uh, that project is currently under construction. Uh, most of the uh, walls have been poured. We are waiting to do uh, the inland side of the wall at the moment, as well as finalizing the design for the parapet wall or the barrier wall, which is the finished wall that sits on top of the seawall. Um, <clears throat> that is essentially what you're going to see from the roadway. And so as a, as, um, as a reminder for what we approved along the Bethany Curve project, we added, um, elevated the roadway roughly, I think, 18 inches, as well as the parapet wall itself. We also lengthened the seawall to provide more resilience. And this particular site will end up connecting to the 1016 wall, as well as the 1030 wall, which I'll, I'll talk over here with you in a second. Uh, the <clears throat> Bethany Curvert Culvert project is slated to, for completion uh, for November of this year. So we're excited to get, again, these uh, critical protections in place uh, prior to next winter season starting. So as we move west, uh, in this image here, you can see the 1030 info wall. Uh, this wall, uh, this site, uh, sustained damage during the 23 event, as well as during the 24 event. This has been a much more challenging area here where we've identified the sea cave that has extended uh, pretty far back into the roadway. Um, so right now the team has been uh, trying to determine the best method to fill that, essentially fill the cave and then build a wall on top of that. Uh, we're working with Coastal Commission staff on revising our ECDP to include this site and include the new design changes. Um, it has been a challenge, though, because there is a lot of sand that migrates back and forth at that site. And so finding that final design 
is important. And so we're, we're pushing to see if we can get this started this year, um, but it is likely that it'll, it'll transpire into the spring. So we've put a date there as a summer of 25 finish. And because the sea cave is so extensive, as I was kind of mentioning earlier, is that we want to keep this site closed. So as this site continues to remain closed, the, the pathway itself, it creates an additional challenge when, when we talk about our temporary traffic control. So it is most likely to stay in place until we can finish the 1030 site. So even though we have 1016 and Bethany uh, slated for completion by the end of this year, uh, we'll have to really just track and monitor uh, what the different site conditions allow us to do as far as reopening the roadway. Okay, next, uh, we have two locations as we're moving west here. Uh, the 1100 path, uh, this is over at David Way. This also sustained damages in, in 2023, but uh, wasn't as critical, seen as critical, because the pathway itself was able to remain open as well as the roadway and the parking at the site. Now we've added temporary barriers out there. There's been an additional, slightly additional erosions and, and we're still working with FHWA on securing that uh, about half million dollar fix at this location. Given that you saw 1030 and you saw the 960 site earlier as we're prioritizing the work that's occurring, we're likely estimating that this site would be complete in spring of 25. And then as you move to the furthest part of, of Westcliff, is the 2100 site, which is what we're also calling the Sacramento Avenue storm drain headwall. Uh, that received some damage, I believe it was in April of 24 of this year, uh, where we had some headwall separation. We immediately installed emergency protective measures to protect the path and have uh, added additional measures there, as you can see, um, uh, with, with uh, erosion control. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in a second too, of some of these other sites. but. Uh, here, uh, we're estimating, I think this project is currently out to bid. We're waiting to get bid results. Our estimate is about 650000 for this site, but we also hope to have this complete by the end of this year. Uh, next up, we have the 800 block. As I mentioned earlier in the very beginning of the presentation about this site, where we are looking at proposing a roadway relocation. Uh, this site here... Um, as we discussed a lot of hard armoring efforts, both in the 900 block, the 1000 block, here at the 800 site, we have an opportunity to work with um, uh, state parks on a potential roadway relocation. And so we've engaged with staff there. They are open to this idea of providing an easement or some type of a right-of-way instrument in order for us to relocate Westcliff uh, into, into the park. Now, what's What's really nice about this is that, as you can see from the image here, we are looking at what the 100-year erosion line would be. And so we're trying to look at relocating the roadway so that it can be resilient, again, to 100 years of erosion. Uh, this would align a lot uh, really well, of course, with our um, recent 50-year vision for Westcliff, as well as uh, the work that was occurring underway for our local coastal uh, program update, local hazard mitigation update. Um, and we've already talked or have engaged with um, the local Coastal Commission staff who are also supportive of this idea. Uh, in addition to this, the, the idea of relocating the roadway here also allows us to, uh, again, as we look at limited harbor armoring and then planned relocation in other, in other areas, gives us the uh, <clears throat> ability to follow our 50-year vision. And then as we negotiate other items with uh, Coastal, Com Coastal Commission and other agencies in the future that we're managing it in a responsible manner. Now, the current site is exposed, will be exposed to at least this winter. So staff doesn't have the ability or the uh, design team to design this uh, full location, uh, roadway relocation this year. So we are uh, actively working to install additional erosion controls, as you saw in the previous image, uh, at the site prior to this winter. Now the challenge, additional challenge with relocating the roadway at 800 site is that, uh, as I mentioned, there would be a right-of-way acquisition that would be involved. Um, it kicks us into a different, sim same funding as far as the emergency opening funding through FHWA, so we'd still be supported in that effort, but it does follow a more standard timeline with a design bid build process. And so with that, um, that means that uh, the likelihood of uh, this site would be exposed this winter and potentially next winter as well. And so um, staff is working again with the erosion control measures for this winter, but we're also looking at um, options for temporary traffic control plans. So 
uh, as the public, um, as we ex hoped that this site can last this winter and again a second winter as well. Uh, we want uh, the uh, members of the public to be aware that we're actively thinking about a few different temporary traffic control plans. And one's my, one uh, consideration is to utilize Pelton. Uh, another one is to, if, we, if there is further erosion that does happen out here, that we can have a two-way, one-lane road that's either controlled by a signal or stop sign, depending on the uh, volume and distance of the erosion that we see out there. Um, and then the third option, too, is that we're looking into is working with our state partners to see if we can build a temporary road in the park. Um, now, it may be for vehicles, it may be for bicycle pedestrians, but as we kind of track the damages that are potentially will occur this winter or even next winter, we'll have to make those adjustments and bring forth back a plan as far as what the uh, true temporary traffic control plan would look like at this site. Um, <clears throat> So because that we're looking for a, a kind of more of a standard design bid build process, uh, staff will be bringing back a, a staff report to authorize a, a roadway relocation, an RFP to seek an, a, a formalized design team in order to get that moving forward. And so we expect to see that sometime in the either October or November uh, meeting. And then the last site I wanted to add here um, that we are uh, is the Lighthouse Point. So as we were instructed earlier this spring, the Lighthouse Point study hazard analysis uh, work uh, has yet to begun. We are working on trying to establish uh, funding for this. We, in spring, we estimated the, the work for this uh, hazard analysis and engineering study to be approximately 150,000. And in order to expedite some of that work, uh, the team has actually reached out to the current consultant team that is working on our nature-based solutions uh, uh, study. And so really it's the, it is the perfect team to work on the study as well. Uh, unfortunately, the, their estimate came in at around 350,000. And so we're, we're actively working and engaging with them to see uh, where that number will land and then finding uh, what, identifying which sources of funding that can be used in order to move this study forward. But we want to just let you know that we are working on it, staff is actually working on it, and that we'll uh, bring back an item once this, uh, once this moves, work starts moving forward. And with that, I'm open to any questions. Mr. Nguyen, thank you very much. Please extend our thanks and appreciation to all of your staff who've done such a great job on this uh, very challenging uh, issue, set of issues. Let me see if there are questions, comments by members. Uh, let me see, Ms. Calatari Johnson, then Madam Vice Mayor Ms. Brenner, are you okay? Here we go. Thank you. Um, really, comment, not so much questions. Just want to acknowledge the work. I know it's huge, huge, huge lifts, um, literally and figuratively. Um, really want to thank the team for all your efforts in moving forward. And just to note that it seems like um, our estimates on this, and there's a consent item. Um, the bids come in higher than our estimates. It seems to be a consistent thing that's happening here that's somewhat delaying our projects. Um, so again, an acknowledgement that even though that, that is a challenge that we face with some of these projects that we're continuing to move forward. So thank you. Madam Vice Mayor. I also want to um, express my appreciation to you, to the team, and to all of the partners that have been out there to make this effort happen. I know it's tremendous amount of work. And my question is, um, in terms of communicating this with the adjacent neighbors, I know there's been some talk internally, but what is our what is our plan at this point so people can be aware of, you know, next steps? I, obviously, this was the first step. But. Yeah, this is the first step in, in really bringing forth the latest updates along Westcliff. Uh, the staff has been working, I believe we provide weekly updates on the, on the website with regards to the status of each one of these projects, but we wanted to be able to kind of present it in a way, uh, in a format that kind of gives you a little bit more photos, um, a little bit more of the background that's happening. Um, I think what we'll do is we'll continue to use the, utilize the website. It is a place, a landing space that the public has gone to for updates along construction, so happy to add this presentation or any other materials to, to really continue that, that effort. Thank you. And I know people have reached out to me that they've really enjoyed the videos and other like aerial footage and things like that that you've shared through social media and other media. Um, people have really appreciated all of the work that went into that communication as well. Awesome. That's great to hear. Erica Smart, communications manager. I just wanted to share too, as we go through this process, we're also entering our five-year 
um, roadmap for our 50-year vision, and we do have three upcoming community engagement opportunities. Now, that doesn't necessarily look at, you know, what we were talking about today with all these updates, but that five-year roadmap for getting us into the 50-year vision. And we have one coming up this month on the 26th, uh, October 22nd and November 19th, and all that information is available on our website, uh, cityofsantacruz.com forward slash Westcliff. Councilmember Bruner is recognized. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for those updates. And um, I think my question somewhat relates to Vice Mayor Golder's question. On our city website, that's where I often go for information, uh, the, web, the Westcliff uh, page on our city website. And I'm wondering if it could be in a timeline format. Um, and if I was wondering if the presentation would be um, uploaded as well, which it sounds like it will. Um, but for for me, it's there's a lot of stuff to navigate through, and I think having it, and this is not for you since you don't manage the website, but I'm just throwing out there that was my question to, to A, if that information will be on the website, B, if that there could be a timeline very clearly um, on the website as well. Thank you. I think that will be helpful. Yeah. Um, so part of the five-year roadmap, we will be working on a full timeline Gantt chart that will ultimately be available once we get there, late December, January timeframe. But we can definitely continue to put all of our resources there and try to make them a little bit easier to follow. I agree, a timeline would be great. We're excited to have that. Thank you. Ms. Brown is recognized. Well, I'll echo my appreciation for the work you all are doing and, and managing uh, extremely challenging circumstances, both environmentally, materially, and um, politically as well, which you're um, <laughs> getting the, you know, you're, you're learning about. <laughs> mm. And um, so I just, yeah, it's incredible. I mean, the, it, the complexity and challenge here is, uh, cannot be understated. I, um, I have a question that's sort of a side question um, related to the storm consequences and the work that's going to be happening related to the errant riprap. We, some of us, I don't know if all of you have, but I've received messages and I'm aware, as I have friends who um, like to surf there, um, you know, the errant riprap at Mitchell's, right, at, at Finger Bowl, Rock Bowl, is um, really causing problems. And I know that getting rid of riprap, moving it, removing it is expensive. It's um, also something that's going to have to happen over the long term, I believe. Um, so just wondering wh where that's at, how it's going. Um, I think that it would be helpful if we, like as much of that work as we can do on the front end is going to really benefit us in the long term. And some surfers in the short term. <laughs> Thanks. A great question, Councilmember Brown. Uh, yes, yeah, part of the projects that are underway, some of the riprap in front of those damaged sites has been relocated or adjusted. Uh, we've asked uh, contractor Granite to work as best as possible to relocate some of that riprap. We know that we've engaged with the Coastal Commission staff. They have the same or similar desire to manage the uh, riprap in a better way. Um, we do have an active project with FEMA, or submission, I should say, with regards to nine different sites, because the, in the original January 23 storm event, we I believe we lost 5,000 tons of riprap out there. Uh, and essentially, what folks realize is that's protection that we're losing uh, along our coastline. So that means that we're more exposed in some of those areas. And so uh, we do have an application, like I said, we're actively working on that, but it has been uh, real slow going when it comes to the FEMA funding side. Um, but as a part of that work, assuming we get the $2 million is what we're requesting at this point, uh, we would include some um, work where we can relocate or adjust or remove uh, riprap where we can. And as you see in some of these with the finished product on, on Westcliff, you'll see a lot of that riprap did get moved as a part of the construction work itself. So some minor improvements, but not necessarily way in, in the break line. Uh, so. For the questions, comments by members. There's no action on this item. Did you wish to comment on this, Ms. Greenside? Please come forward. Certainly. Yes, appreciation to Director Nguyen for that excellent report. I learned quite a bit. And um, so I, my eye caught on what I didn't know were the choices 
where the temporary road is being negotiated with uh, the state parks. I hope that works out well, but the, it was the interim choices um, that I'd like to comment on, uh, since one of them was utilising Pelton. And I'm sure I'm speaking for more than just myself, but others probably don't know that that's a choice. I think that would, should be not a choice uh, for a number of reasons, one of which Pelton starts at the surfer statue. So that's a huge diversion and cuts off uh, at least one way of uh, Westcliff to use that as one of the alternatives. Um, temporary road might be difficult, but a signal seems to be, I think, uh, it would be harmony in the neighbourhoods. You wouldn't have a lot of people down here, you know, uh, feeling agitated of the, what that diversion down Pelton means. And uh, I, I travel around quite a bit of roads that were damaged in past storms, and that traffic signal to stop one way, it was up at, um, uh, well, I can't remember the name of the place, a number of places that is used. It seems to work very well. And this is a very discreet area. It's not a long mile or so. So I would uh, strongly suggest that that be the choice uh, rather than the others. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Thank you, Ms. Greenside. We are moving on now to presiding officer announcements. Uh, I have none. Statements of a disqualification member, anybody? Ms. Brown. I um, just want to let everyone know that I will need to recuse myself from the vote on item 14. Okay. This is a funding proposal for affordable housing in close proximity to my residence. Thank you. We are on additions and or deletions. Ms. Bush, any additions or deletions? No, there aren't. Mr. Condotti. Good afternoon, Mayor Keeley, members of the City Council. Um, this morning, the Council met at 10 a.m. in closed session to discuss uh, a number of real property negotiations items. Uh, those are, uh, or rather, the Council received a report from and gave direction to its negotiator concerning several city-owned properties uh, and their uh, tenants. First property, 17B and C, Municipal Wharf. Uh, tenant, Roseanne Mazzoni and John Eicholtz, DBA Bonnie's Gifts. Second item, 50A, 55A, Municipal Wharf. Uh, and the party is Marini's Candies, Inc. Third item, 55D, Municipal Wharf. Uh, the tenant is Genesis Peck, DBA Made in Santa Cruz. 47 Municipal Wharf, uh, Tenant Flotsam of California, Inc., DBA, Nolans. 15 Municipal Wharf, uh, Tenant is JFS, Inc., DBA, Santa Cruz Boat Rentals. 17 E Municipal Wharf, Sock Shop and Shoe Company, Inc., 1070 River Street, Arts Council of Santa Cruz County. 41 B Municipal Wharf, Flotsam of California, Inc., 2 Municipal Wharf, uh, DBA, uh, Dave Johnston, DBA Venture Quest, 125 Coral Street, uh, City and Housing Matters, and 125 Coral Street, uh, City and uh, Harley and Jim Gillespie. Uh, there was no reportable action on those items. Item two was a conference with legal counsel concerning existing litigation. There were two items discussed with legal counsel. First, Santa Cruz Cop Watch versus City of Santa Cruz, currently pending in the Santa Cruz County Superior Court. Second item, also pending in the Santa Cruz County Superior Court, Doug Wallace et al. versus the City of Santa Cruz. Items three, or item three was one item of conference with legal counsel concerning significant exposure to litigation. Item four was one uh, conference with legal counsel concerning potential initiation of litigation. Uh, there was no reportable action on those items. Thank you, sir. Ms. Bush, council meeting calendar, any updates? No updates, no. Thank you very much. We are on the consent agenda for those of you that might be unfamiliar with it. We will be taking up items 10 through 23 inclusive
on one motion. What we will do is give the opportunity for council members to pull an item, comment on an item, or make or provide a, uh, a question for a response. Uh, the public will also be given that opportunity. Uh, when you are given that opportunity to comment on the consent agenda, you will be given three minutes to comment on all items who you wish to comment on, as opposed to three minutes for each item. We will start on my right. We'll go with Mr. Newsom. Mr. Newsom on the consent agenda. Thank you, Mayor. I want to make a just very brief comment on item 20. Um, this item deals with much needed infrastructure improvements in my district. Um, particularly, it authorizes a contract for a new roof on the London Nelson uh, Community Center, which is a vital asset in our community. I'm really happy to see this item on our agenda and want to thank Director Gwynn and Operations Manager Warren for bringing this forward. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Brown is recognized on the consent agenda. Thank you, Mayor. I would like to pull item 13. These are the city's responses to the grand jury reports we received. That item will be pulled. Ms. Watkins on the consent agenda. Madam Vice Mayor on the consent agenda. Ms. Gondar Johnson on the consent agenda. Thank you. Comments on 11 and 16. Um, item 11 is um, the application for Ms. Sherry Gaddick on the Commission for the Violence. Commission for the Prevention of Violence Against Women. Just want to acknowledge and thank um, Ms. Gaddick for her application and hopeful that we will approve that and looking forward to having her serve um, on the commission as my appointee. And then item 16 is the Neary Lagoon floating walkway, which is in District 3, my district. Um, I just, I want to acknowledge and thank the Parks and Rec staff. This has been a few years coming that they've been working on this. Um, the, the decking and the railing rehabilitation and the new interpretive signs that are there, it improves access to um, this community asset for the community. And I know that there is a reopening, a grand reopening next week, I believe next Tuesday. So looking forward to celebrating that. And um, for community members who use Neary Lagoon, I invite you all to come join us. Councilmember Brown, uh, excuse me, Bruner is recognized on the consent agenda. Thank you, Mayor. Um, let's see, I had a comment on 13, but it looks like it was pulled, so I'll save that. And um, I wanted to also just uh, comment on the London Nelson Community Center roof repair um, and just thank uh, everyone for this work. Um, with that item and also on 18 uh, this is the contract amendment to with B cycle for Santa Cruz County regional bike share program and um, I just had a question regarding um, continued uh, discount through the go Santa Cruz program so if anybody you have a question on that let me see if there's someone with us mr. Nguyen Oh, there's uh, Claire Galuli. Uh, thank Galugli. you for being here. You can ask. Please proceed with your question, Council Member. Hi, thank you, Claire Galuli with Public Works. Uh, for downtown employees who are enrolled in the Go Santa Cruz program, we continue to offer free B cycle memberships for them. Previously, we had offered two months of free memberships, and now we offer continued free memberships for as long as you're employed downtown. Thank you. That's good to know because I know that um, with these um, proposed fees that they're still not a low income option and with the Go Santa Cruz program, I know there's a lot of low income earners in that program. So it's a way to kind of get at that option. Um, thank you. Is there anything else on the fees around that? Um, the other thing is that B-Cycle is working with individual organizations, including the Health Services Agency right now, to provide discounted B-Cycle memberships to those that qualify for county programs to the Health Services Agency. Great. Thank you. It's such a um, great asset to have accessible for everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Let me ask if there's anyone with us today who wishes to comment on one or more items on the consent agenda. This would be your opportunity to do so. Ms. Bush, do we have anyone online? We'll take the person online. I don't see anyone rising to uh, oh, get teed up over here. We'll take the person online. Yeah, okay. Yeah, this is Garrett. Um, you know, I, I can't say on this is item 14. It's a match grant extending up to $700,000 of our taxpayer dollars 
to create a matching grant to produce socialist price fixed housing plus undisclosed extra state expenses. Uh, what the unelected bureaucrats beyond the reach of the people exactly have in mind here is buried in pages and pages of bureaucratic verbosities. And I can't say I read all those uh, for the qualifications of projects, but knowing how you guys operate, uh, you know, I'm going more so on my general impressions. Uh, these are the kinds of items that grow the government and its cost without providing much service at all to most people. It's also more of the budget expanding, take the big outside money with its attendant requirements, which aren't necessarily in the local citizen interest, but you have to go along with what the money says you have to do. Uh, while the so-called project housing, welfare housing of the 50s and 60s had its problems, you know, sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't. And I think it, when it worked, it worked better than the pure socialist so-called affordable price fixed housing that continues to be proposed here. And I don't think this is a return to that uh, project housing, although it does have the cost sharing aspect. Because Eden Housing and the For the Future housing developers are leftist ideological developers that you seem to have an affinity for that share many strange notions like equity and a preoccupation with race and all things leftist that should have little to do with uh, welfare type housing. These partnerships between government and so-called nonprofits sure can be breeding opportunities for milking the taxpayer in a form of corruption that actually results in housing that's net more expensive than the free market. We'll find out the hard way if it gets junked up with pure socialism and defective equity uh, notions. Uh, the real source of unaffordable housing is government overspending, money printing, crazy low interest rates, leading to inflation, and this uh, current super bubble in housing costs. You know the bubble can burst, uh, and overbuilding is one way to do that, your way, but it won't be fun if and when it happens. Uh, the the solution is not taxing the public. It's less government spending on thousands of useless priorities like war and pork barrel projects by the Fed. Uh, in general, I disapprove of meddling government interfering with the free market and housing <laughs> demanding that vacancy rates, rates be over 5%. I'm guessing free market developers are better at assessing risk than governments that take no risk. Yep, we're on the path of the old cesspool of government dependence here. Um, yep, there's some poor and deserving people and some moral responsibility to help the truly deserving that exists. I'm not sure you can deliver on ensuring the deserving part, and it feels like you are catering, uh, inviting, and growing an increasingly poorer population here. There really isn't a housing shortage in the city, only a surfeit of low-income people. The population is unchanged in 10 years. Somebody pays for subsidies, and it's not the government. Others pay, not those, and it's not those receiving subsidies. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Good afternoon. Welcome. I'm Steve Bosworth, a concerned community member. I want to give a sh short comment on the uh, uh, great grand jury's uh, the staff's preparation of... That item um, has been continued. We'll be glad to recognize you when we take up that item. When will that be, please? It'll be in just a moment. Okay. Yeah, we're going to finish with the consent agenda. Then Ms. Brown will open on that item. There may be other questions. We'll certainly take Good. your comment Thank at you. that time. Thank you, sir. Anyone else on the consent agenda? I'd like to move the consent agenda. Motion. Second, Second. by... Ms. Watkins, all items except for item 13, uh, debate or discussion, seeing hearing none, the clerk will call the roll. Council Member Newsom? Aye. Brown? Aye, with the exception of item 14, where I've recused. Watkins? Aye. Brunner? Aye. Kalantari Johnson? Aye. Vice Mayor Golder? Aye. And Mayor Keeley? Aye. Motion passes and so ordered Ms. Brown on item 13. Uh, so I don't want to give a, a grand, grand opening to this item. I, um, I just want to say these are... Um, the grand jury uh, convenes and takes up a variety of issues in our community related to local government and um, with a particular focus on kind of accountability and transparency. And um, this year we have a couple of reports that, um, you know, I feel the responses were um, inadequate. And um, I'm not thrilled that it comes to us on consent. These are uh, responses that are ostensibly coming from the entire council with you, Mayor, uh, you know, responding on our behalf. 
And um, there's a lot in here. Um, I, I just want to raise the concern, a couple of overall concerns, and then give people in the public a, a time, the time to speak. Um, you know, I don't feel comfortable with the um, having read the reports. Um, I don't feel comfortable that we've adequately responded to um, what I believe was, you know, really committed and, and good work. Uh, so I. I also want to say, and another thing I want to say that we got some comments about, so you all may be thinking about this too, is that with the agenda packet, um, the reports weren't included. And now they are publicly accessible, but you have to go look it up and figure out where to find, get them. And it's my um, suspicion that that's not something that a lot of folks are, um, were inclined to do. It wasn't in our packet. Those reports should have been in our packet so we could just discern whether or not we think the responses adequately get at the concerns. So um, I'm going to leave it there. I do have some more specific concerns. If we end up getting into some discussion, I'll raise them. But I wanted to give members of the public an opportunity to speak to those um, on, separately. So that's Thank you, That's Council my Member. Let me see wrap. if there are other comments by members before we open this to the public. Comments? Your opportunity to speak, sir. Good afternoon again. Thank you again. Uh, uh, reading the whole report is very important, and I go along with Councillor Brown on that. Uh, having read that, it seems like the draft responses that staff had provided are woefully inadequate. Uh, since 2006, there's an, been an ordinance which uh, re <clears throat> requires, with regard to inclusionary housing, requires preference to be given to Santa Cruz uh, residents and workers. The report discovered that the uh, council has not collected any information that would allow it to claim or citizens to find out that that preference, those preferences, have been given. As a consequence of that, the, uh, the grand jury also recommended, therefore, that for the future, the city website provide a, uh, a uh, dashboard account of uh, how many uh, people, citizens and workers, have benefited from uh, that uh, mandate. Uh, and so that's the key thing, and the, the, draft, the draft suggested ignore that completely, uh, and that's a woeful mistake. But since the council is uh, responsible for responding, I hope you will take that clear failing on the part of the staff uh, in, into account when you answer. Thank you, sir. Anyone else on this item? Hi. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Ann Simonton, and I'm on the commission. And for six years, I've noticed it being diminished by city staff. And also, I, um, as chair, I wasn't even able to get the files by Susie O'Hara. She kept them from me. And this seemed to be related to my position on the recall which was really an unfortunate, uh, you know, retaliation. Um, I'm shocked that the city has chosen to disagree with so much of the, this uh, in, important information that we could use to become more effective. I mean, it's, it's offered as a gift, and I think that we should see it as a gift. And I think, you know, you don't even have to say much if you just agree with each one. <laughs> so anyway, that's something that I think needs to be uh, important, is very important. Redacted reports are also very important for police investigations. Again, um, looking at this could help us um, understand when we need more police uh, trainings, as I've mentioned earlier in the meeting. Um, uh, there isn't really an invasion of privacy, as uh, Kandati has tried to prove, but this is not, uh, does not hold up in terms of, re of a redacted report. Um, uh, I also want to mention that we need expanded metrics, very important. NIBRS is really an, an interesting and an exciting program that's being used by Scotts Valley, the county, state parks, already are, are, are online and public. 
So to have Santa Cruz uh, be on there should be a high priority. NIBRS offers uh, an array of really important metrics that we could pull from and help our community be safer. Um, I also would like to enhance uh, CPVA's W's uh, educational reach, which was mentioned in the grand jury around the five-year uh, strategic plan. Also, I noted that Health and All Policies does mentions mental health and obesity, but does not mention um, uh, sexual assault and prevention of crime even. Uh, so that's, that seems important. And um, ec your economic development pro uh, department has decided that, that we are no longer, CPVAW is no longer able to hang banners. Why? Because they say it's not, you know, helping businesses or some kind of thing. I hope that that could change and that we would have an opportunity. Education is core and the prevent prevention work, as I understand it, over my 40 years of working in this field, that it's, it's a great way to uh, create a positive message um, that, you know, promotes compassion and peace and can greatly enhance CPVAW's mission. Um, I also the, well, I want to thank you very much for having a part-time staff person. That's terrific. This is going to really help us a lot. My um, only concern is that this part-time staff person not be uh, supervised by someone who has a conflict of interest. This is uh, something that the, this city council needs to look into. Um, there is definitely biases going on. Thank you so much. Thank anyone. you. Anyone else on this item? Ms. Greenside, good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon, Mayor and um, Vice Mayor and Council Members, Gillian Greenside. I'm speaking as an individual, a member of the community. However, I was on the civil grand jury for the last year, and I sent you my uh, rebuttal to the staff's um, responses. The civil grand jury is a very unique institution. It doesn't exist in many states any longer. It does in California. And each county is mandated to empower or empanel a civil grand jury of citizens to look into local government and make uh, deep investigations and uh, recommend changes if they see there's a need for accountability and transparency. It's really working with you, not against you. Um, the there's no enforcement to this. Uh, it relies on um, publicity, so the public knows what the investigations found as lacking. And it relies on your integrity to respond in a way that respects the amount of work that went into the investigations, um, the validity and citations of the facts on which that was based. So in terms of publicity, uh, only the Sentinel has covered these issues, thanks to the uh, Santa Cruz Sentinel. Requests were made to look out and nothing was covered. Uh, neither did Santa Cruz Local cover these issues. And so it's likely that the public is not very aware of either your responses or your staff's responses or even the issues. And in, in terms of, uh, as uh, Councilmember Brown pointed out, uh, the reports weren't even in your agenda packet. And I wrote on two occasions requesting that they, put, because the Commission held two meetings on for their responses, requesting that uh, the full reports be put in there. Because if you don't read the port, reports, you don't know the facts on which the findings and recommendations are made. Didn't appear. And so I think that uh, what you're faced with, I know you have a lot of respect for your staff and they serve you well. In this instance, they are not serving you well. The responses are inadequate. They're inaccurate. I've detailed all that. I can't go over it in my time running out. I would suggest that you ask for a month's grace period that you form an ad hoc committee. I know that has to be agendized of council members to count for council, initiate your own responses and submit that to the civil grand jury. Thank you. Sorry. Do we have anyone online, Ms. Bush? No, we don't. Anyone else with us wish to comment on the item? Matters back before the body, Ms. Brown. I'd like to make a motion that we that the council 
ask the mayor to submit a request for an additional month. I hadn't thought about a month, but that's a good idea. Uh, a month in order to better review and revise these responses with input from staff um, and uh, with the assistance of a council subcommittee. There's a motion. Is there a second? A second. There's a motion. There's a second by Ms. Bruner. Ms. Brown on your motion. Thank you. So I, I, um, I, I recognize that there is, there's a lot on our agenda today and there's a lot in these reports and um, I'd, I'd prefer to, rather than going through those now and taking up our time in a way that may not be productive, I would much rather uh, u utilize my time uh, and I'd be happy to participate in a process by which the council members can um, you know, review, give input, try to come to some more um, you know, responsive <laughs> responses. And um, so that, that's my rationale. I think that um, the grand jury would be happy to accept, and my guess is they'd be happy to accept a late response over uh, a highly inadequate, and in some cases, I would argue, obfuscating response. When I, uh, as a teacher, I tell my students, um, you know, I'd rather you ask for extra time than give me something that is uh, disrespectful to the process. And, um, and they often take me up on that. And so I think this is a useful uh, approach in this case, um, and I'd, I'd you know, if, if we don't have support for that, then I'd, um, you know, I guess I'll talk about some of the concerns and think about other ways to use this as an organizing tool. Thanks. Thank you. Further debate or discussion, Ms. Bruner. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I initially had a question on this before it was pulled, a comment. Um, and, you know, we've had this before where civil grand jury responses and and so I know they're publicly accessible on the, uh, the grand jury site, any of the reports um, across the county and other jurisdictions. Um, but I'm wondering if, and sometimes there are hundreds of pages, and our agenda packets are already hundreds of pages, but if in future in the agenda reports um, a link could be included to the public website. And so... Uh, thanks for that question, Council Member Bruner. Uh, we can certainly do that going forward. We did go back and look at our past responses, and in 2020, 2021, and 2023, the full reports were not included in the packet. So this has been our standard practice, but we can certainly link to it going forward. There's uh, no problem in doing so. Thank you. And then my other question is: was on the timeline of, um, you know, when is it due and bringing it back to assess further review and input. Sure, so the current deadline is September 16th. So with the council's action today, uh, the response would be timely. We could certainly go back to, um, to the grand jury and request additional time. I can't speak to whether or not that request would be granted. Thank you for that information. Further, further debate or discussion, Ms. Brown. Well. Hearing no other comments, I'm guessing that this uh, motion is not going to pass, and, and as a result, no? Okay. <laughs> um, I'd love to hear, I just, uh, I, 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 maybe I'm wrong. I'd love to have a yes vote on this so I don't have to go through this list right now, and we can get out of here by the time we're hoping for. So, all right, I'll, I'll just keep, leave it there then. Uh, I was very briefly on this item. It does seem, I checked with the city attorney and city manager, it does seem that we do have this legal deadline on the 16th. Uh, I think it is fair for us to assert to the grand jury, here is the response. The response is asking for another month. And I think that's responsive uh, of a sort. And so I'm going to support the motion. Uh, let me say this about grand jury reports. This is my 43rd grand jury report I've read since I became an elected official in 1989, uh, 1981 as a staff member at the Board of Supervisors. Uh, I'll make this general observation. I think that grand jury reports are uneven. I think that they are better in some subject matters than in other subject matters. They don't, they don't purport to be experts. They do very quiet, 
uh, uh, meetings with, with various folks. They look into subject matters. Uh, I think some of the work that they do is actually quite good, and some of it is frankly not worth the paper it's written on. Uh, I think this is a case where it is worth the paper that it's written on, and I think it's a good idea uh, for us to take a look at this and take a little more time to provide a feedback. I would say that I think that it would be helpful on a going forward basis if in the years to come we receive this with a month to go before our deadline rather than running into this situation. Further questions or comments in hearing none, the clerk will call the roll. Councilmember Newsom? Aye. Brown? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Bruner? Aye. Calentari Johnson? Aye. Vice Mayor Golder? Aye. Mayor Kuhn? Aye. That'll show you, Ms. Brown. We are on item 24. Uh, we have completed with the consent agenda. We're on item 24. This is a public hearing uh, on an ordinance of the city of Santa Cruz, uh, make certain technical changes to our ordinance establishing the Commission for the Prevention of Violence Against Women. Are there questions or comments on this item? Anyone wish to testify on this item? Seeing here none, the matter is back before the body. Mr. Newsom moves. Ms. Uh, Contar Johnson seconds. Debate or discussion? Seeing here none, the clerk will call the roll. Councilmember Newsom? Aye. Brown? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Brunner? Aye. Helen Torrey Johnson? Aye. Vice Mayor Golder? Aye. Mayor Keeley? Aye. Uh, motion passes and so ordered. I am not sure. Are our county partners here on the core item? No. We will move to item 26. And in order to go forward, uh, we'll, uh, we'll jump over this item. We'll come back uh, to it. We are on an or number 26. This is an ordinance and resolution responsive to an incident involving the city of Hanford Police Department. Uh, let me open by saying that uh, this situation has been, I think, uh, well uh, uh, vetted in the public space. I want to thank our homeless response team, the uh, folks up at the Armory, uh, all of our partners in county government and city government who uh, took it upon ourselves uh, without the proper process being followed by another city. I took it upon ourselves to not victimize this person again and in fact help her uh, in, in her life situation. However, having said that, I do believe that this is a good opportunity for us to enforce the concept that uh, we will do our very best with our county government partners and with our folks in various nonprofits and the faith community to assist our fellow residents who are experiencing homelessness. What we know from the point in time survey is that most of the folks who are homeless in Santa Cruz became homeless in the city of Santa Cruz. And the point in time survey further indicates that those folks became homeless because they lost a job. And uh, uh, we want to assist those folks first and foremost. Folks who come into the community of their own volition, uh, that happens. We're a free country. You can move around this country. And we understand that. The instance we're trying to deal with is where another government, without prior communication with us, wants to bring a homeless person and essentially dump them in our community. That doesn't do that person any good, doesn't do the community that sent them to us, uh, really. Is that is that the right way they should respond? And I think that uh, having this ordinance uh, sends a message, uh, frankly, in our county and outside our county, that this is not responsible behavior by governments. That if you want to see if there's a, a way for a person experiencing homeless in some other community to get a better chance at life here in this community because they have family or friends or connections, whatever it is, uh, give us a call. We work on that kind of thing all the time. Mr. M. Wally and his staff, the police department, our friends in the nonprofit community in the county of Santa Cruz County government. We do that kind of thing on a regular basis. What we need to do is make sure that uh, other communities are as responsible about 
managing their homeless community as uh, we think we are in our community. Uh, let me see if uh, council members have any opening comments you would wish to make on this item. Start through here. Anyone? Madam Vice Mayor. I would say um, similarly to what you stated that we have done a lot of work in this community in order to stand up resources for the homeless individuals that are living in the city. And we, I feel in this instance taken advantage of by the city of Hanford. Um, it's the responsibility of every jurisdiction in this country to contribute to ending homelessness. And because we have a generous community and people uh, willing to use our tax dollars to support getting people back into housing, it doesn't mean that we're going to solve homelessness for the entire state or for the entire country. Everybody needs to step up and do their fair share. Everybody, and this is not um, this is not something that will be tolerated here in Santa Cruz. Ms. Bruner. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to comment, thank you for um, emphasizing, I think, you know, the point of having a, a pre-planned support system and safety plan is um, really important in these incidences as is our homeward bound program, for example, where there's always a connection on the other end um, in place before um, someone is um, given a bus ticket or transportation. Um, our officers, as far as I understand, as we looked into it, have never done this. And, you know, our, our program is the homeward bound program where there's always pre-approved, you know, safety plan, um, support system plan. And this is a case where that none of that was in place. And um, really to... Um, prevent anything like that happening again, I think this is an important step um, to really ensure uh, support for the person who's unsheltered as well as any community that um, has very limited resources already to begin with. And um, so, yes, I, I want to thank you for that. Thank you. Ms. Kalantari Johnson is Thank you. Yeah, just some comments um, that you know, we are one of very few city jurisdictions that has uh, really tried to address the homelessness issue the way that we have with a full framework, um, investing our general fund dollars. And I think, uh, well, I don't want to speak for you all, but I think we as a council are proud of the work that we've done. Um, sure, there may be some bumps in the road that we will continue to work through. And we heard from some folks during oral communication today, but a 36% decrease in point in time, time, time count in one year, and then a 29% decrease the year before, that is, that is no small feat. Um, and it's because we've tried really hard. So this is an invitation to other jurisdictions who are challenged in the way that we know many cities across the country are to, um, instead of trying to dump, quote unquote, their problems on another city, reach out to us. I've talked to other mayors and council members from across the country, frankly, about our framework and how we're trying to think outside the box um, with the very little resources that we have. So reach out to us. We're happy to share with you how we've approached it and the lessons learned that we continue to have um, so that they can implement similar um, policies and programs and frameworks in their communities. Thank you. Council Member Watkins. Yes, thank you, Mayor. I'll be brief. Um, I, I was shocked when I heard about this incident. I thought it was really unusual to have a law enforcement agency from over two hours away to take time to bring an individual here. Um, I also want to echo my colleagues' comments around our structure and really working hard to identify who we're serving and how to best serve them to ensure their success and ultimate um, goal of hopefully independence. Uh, so having this type of action as a outcome of this incident makes a lot of sense to me and I appreciate you bringing it forward, Mayor. I also just wanna echo the comments that were made by my colleagues around an invitation for other jurisdictions to step up to do what they can to address the needs in their community. Uh, we all will need to do our part and as was mentioned, we have limited abilities and resources locally. So we are reliant on that interconnectivity of um, 
of solutions to this very challenging problem. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Newsom is recognized. <laughs> well, thank you, Mayor. I um, just want to associate myself with the comments that have been uh, made so far, and I want to thank you for bringing this uh, much needed ordinance forward. Uh, you know, I, this ordinance is about protecting our community, and it's also about ensuring that everyone who comes to Santa Cruz is treated with dignity and respect. Uh, you know, that there's a plan in place for if someone is brought here by another jurisdiction instead of just attempting to abandon them in a parking lot. Um, and it is essential we hold other jurisdictions accountable for their actions, and especially when those actions negatively impact our residents, and especially when they negatively impact our residents who are most at need. Uh, and, and I just want to uh, echoed the comments that have been made about others' jurisdictions, um, trying to take a step forward in addressing their needs. Uh, you know, we try to, we do a good job and try to address our um, issues here. And I think other, I think other jurisdictions should follow our lead on that. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Brown. Thank you, Mayor. I um, have a I have a comment I, that is a little bit different than what uh, my my colleagues have said, and uh, not contradicting it, but I wanted to add this into the conversation, hopefully the community conversation, because one of the things that I've been really kind of sorry about as I've uh, seen the, the stories come out and, and the narrative um, is that, you know, what the, the incident itself, right? I am supporting this because I am opposed to the forced displacement by any agent of the state, whatever agent that might be, local, state, national, um, forcibly moving a person. And I think that's something we should all be concerned about as well. And I appreciate uh, my colleagues' comments about dignity and respect in particular. And for anyone who's out there listening and wondering about this, um, just the summary of the interview with Person Doe in our agenda report beginning at the bottom of page two will give you a sense of how this incident evolved and how egregious it was. So I want to, I, I hope that the, the framing, that, that the narrative, and I see some folks from the media here, will include that point that we are opposed to forced displacement. That's why I think this is so important. Um, so thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Let me see if there's anyone with us who wishes to make comment on this item. We would take your testimony at this time. Ms. Bush, while the gentleman is approaching, do we have anyone online? No one with their hand raised. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, sir. Welcome. Yeah, I don't know. This is, this is kind of a, a meretricious issue. Uh, you've got people to talk about uh, buying people bus tickets elsewhere uh, because they're homeless and you've got, you know, these communities dropping off a disabled person who may or may not have some connection to uh, local residents, may or may not be fully homeless, 100%, you know, may or may not be mentally ill or have a drug problem mm -hmm. uh, or, uh, uh, you know, who, who knows who knows what their justification for bringing the individual here. I think it's a lot of drama. I wish, I wish uh, this kind of thing wouldn't be on the agenda. Um, I'm, a, I'm a little bit frustrated that there aren't, there aren't printed agendas because I have to now run to the library um, to, to print one to see what's up uh, next. Thanks. Thank you. Are they? Are they? Thank you so much. Thank you. Greg, good, af good afternoon again, sir. Welcome. Good afternoon. Um, thank you, Mayor, for uh, inviting me to that uh, press conference. Um, it was kind of an offhand thing, but um, I, it, man, it hit home just to consider what the person Doe went through. Um, spoke with uh, 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 Supervisor uh, Cummings afterwards a little bit, and, and he brought up a great point, which is, hmm, should we troll this by the, uh, the AG, Attorney General? Um, it's almost kidnapping. And we can't do anything retroactively with with the resolution, um, but I don't know. It's kind of maybe it's per, worth pursuing at least to like give them the little chills down their spine that uh, they're coming close to a doing a bad bad thing. But we're doing good good things here. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Others matters back before the body. Is there a motion? I'll move. Motion to approve the recommendation <laughs> is submitted. Second by Mr. Newsom. Uh, under discussion, you may open on your motion. I have made my comments. So thank okay. you again, Mayor, for bringing this forward. Certainly. 
So mm -hmm. Thank you for bringing us forward. Uh, I will add one final comment. That is, I do want to thank Supervisor Cummings. Not only did he show up at uh, the opportunity to communicate this with the press the other day, he indicated that the Board of Supervisors was taking up a larger question around their homelessness plans, a regular agenda item that they had today, and he intended to integrate this into that conversation and perhaps, if appropriate, the county may look at a similar kind of ordinance. And I want to thank the supervisor. He's enormously helpful to us on so many things, and uh, uh, this in particular, we thank him for that. The clerk will call the vote. Councilmember Newsom? Aye. Brown? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Bruner? Aye. Valentari Johnson? Aye. Vice Mayor Golder? Aye. And Mayor Keeley? Aye. The motion passes and so ordered. Uh, Mr. <coughs> Wally, yes, no, county partners? Okay. Uh, uh, very good, meaning I understand. Mayor, uh, really quick, we did hear that they may not be available until about 3.30. 3.30? Well, they, we may uh, miss them today. We may need to reschedule this item perhaps. In fact, let's just go ahead and do that right now. We're going to continue this item to our next regular meeting. Item 27, industrial land preservation policy. Mr. Butler and his team, I imagine they are running over here right now, not knowing that we were going to jump over an item in front of them. Uh, we will give them, let's do this. Let's just, take, uh, let's just take five minutes. We're doing fine on our agenda right now. Let's take a five minute break. We'll be back at 1.30 sharp. Council's back in session following our five-minute afternoon recess that began at 1.25 and five minutes later at 1.37, we are back. And as I used to say when I was the presiding officer in the assembly, in legislative time, everybody can run a four-minute mile. So we are on item number 27, industrial land preservation policy. Mr. Butler, good afternoon and welcome, sir. Thank you, Mayor and Council Members. I'm Lee Butler, Director of Planning and Community Development for the city. And before you is the industrial land preservation policy. You've all heard me say at one point or another that uh, from a land use perspective, the only thing that's equally, if not more important than the provision of housing is the protection of our employment lands, particularly our industrial lands. They set up a cycle for success for personal, social, cultural, environmental, and fiscal health for our city. And this policy recognizes the longstanding regulations of the city to prohibit residential uses in industrial zones other than live work units and sets forth some objective standards that support the city's longstanding approach. This does not mean that residential can't ever be done in industrial areas. We saw that happen on Delaware Addition where a plan development permit um, in that case, also a development agreement um, allowed for use variations. However, such action would be completely discretionary, not mandated by the state as many housing approvals are these days, and would still need to find general plan consistency through the broader range of goals and policies in the general plan that apply to the city. And I'm available for any questions that you may have. If I might. Just get this out of the way early because I, I, I think this is a, a question about whether or not there is a conflict of policies here. Industrially zoned land is largely about investment and jobs. Uh, we also over here have housing requirements and issues. Let me ask you this. Do you think that there is anything in here that would prohibit housing on developments housing developments on industrial zone land. And the reason I ask that is that if the answer is yes, do we then get into this issue with HCD about we may be removing some properties that 
could be available for housing under certain circumstances, and therefore we need to find other places in the city to add that housing back in. Great question. Thank you for that. That is a uh, consideration that no net loss provisions in the state law require that if you're reducing general plan capacity, and we looked at that question carefully as part of our team, the general plan specifically states that residential uses are discouraged except for limited live work units. And we have consistently interpreted that to say residential units are not allowed in the industrial land use designations. And this policy still allows for that limited live work um, aspect to proceed while also being very clear that the residential uses, multifamily residential uses are not allowed, although there is that path that one could follow. And so that was very much a consideration as we were contemplating this and wanting to make sure that we were not running afoul of state law as it relates to that no net loss provision. We believe that we have been operating in this manner consistently since uh, the new general plan was put into place and therefore we do not believe that we're running into a, a no net loss issue here. Follow up question. I know that you are maybe more frequently than ever before in the last two or three years been in virtually constant communication with HCD, whether it's about certifying our housing element or some other question we may have here and there about how in this changing environment of theirs, they agree with what you just said. We have not run this particular item past HCD. Um, we do talk with them regularly um, on various issues. Um, but this specific topic, we have not had conversations with HCD regarding it. Okay. Thank you. Questions or comments by board members? Let me see if there's anyone with us who wishes to make comment on this item. Anyone online, Ms. Bush? We will take the pers first person online, and good afternoon. Good afternoon, person online. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you All for right. joining us. Yes, uh, this is Rafa Sonnenfeld. I'm today calling on behalf of uh, of EMB Law in my professional capacity. Um, I appreciated the mayor's comments and uh, the the no net loss concern is is something that we are uh, very much interested in. Uh, I would suggest that the um, uh, the council move to uh, table this item until the uh, planning department has had those conversations with HCD and uh, and also provides a more uh, uh, a written uh, uh, accounting of the uh, of the zone capacity and uh, an explanation for how uh, this change to the development standards does not inhibit uh, uh, or does not reduce the uh, the net capacity of housing in industrial lands. Um, for example, uh, there are uh, some projects that are in the pipeline right now, uh, including one on the Almar Street that is proposed to be approximately 120 units. Uh, the base density for that project is 60 units, um, and and that's currently allowed under the law. And uh, uh, it would be uh, very strange if if the city you know made this change uh, to preclude such projects if if uh, 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 if if it didn't find that that such a, a project uh, was was no was still feasible. Um, I think we have to show that that uh, that there is not a reduction in total uh, total zoned uh, capacity. That's not just number of units that's also total square footage of of uh floor area for residential and uh and this change which uh basically says that 95 percent of the of the proposed uh project has to be industrial um seems like a reduction in overall housing square footage that needs to be analyzed and um and mitigated through a no net loss upzoning necessary thank you Thank you, Mr. Schoenfeld. Anyone else online? Anyone else with us who wishes to make comment? Do you wish to comment on that item, sir? Mr. Butler? Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mayor. 
<clears throat> so a couple of things um, that I would um, want to point out. One is the uh, policy that uh, HCD did certify as part of our housing element. And I'll read that policy here. It says, um, this is actually in our housing element. Mm -hmm. It says, support a balance of jobs and housing land uses by only considering residential uses in industrial land if it is ancillary to industrial land's full employment capacity being achieved in an economically viable manner, and if it does not negatively impact existing or future industrial uses in the area, except in the vicinity of Coral Street, and it goes on to talk about um, some, some changes that we're contemplating on Coral Street. Um, that full um, employment capacity is what uh, HCD has actually certified as part of our housing element. And that is where um, we were looking to get an objective standard related to that mm -hmm. as it pertains to um, the what, what does full employment capacity mean. Um, so that's part A. Part B, um, the caller, Rafa, referred to the site at A31 Almar. I'll note that uh, A31 Almar has submitted an application for a plan development permit within um, the last couple of weeks here. That plan development permit is the avenue in which one would pursue residential uses on industrially designated properties. Um, so. Um, just wanted to put that uh, additional information out there for the council and, and available for any questions should the council have any. Thank you, sir. Let me ask you this question. Uh, does this constitute a general plan amendment? It does not. It does not. Thank you. That's important to know. That is important. Uh, and if you don't mind, I'll, I'll do a little, a little more commentary on that. Uh, the no net loss provision actually speaks to that specifically is, is changes to the general plan that um, would um, trigger a loss in residential capacity. Thank you, sir. Welcome. Let me ask if there are other questions or comments by board members. Anyone with us wish to comment? Anyone online? Ms. Bush, not on this item. Back before the body. I'll move yeah. recommendation. Ms. Watkins. <laughs> Usually people are jumping out. Yeah, please <laughs> say. Yeah. Is there a second? <laughs> okay, Ms. Brown, there we go. We have a motion and a second under debate. Seeing here none, the clerk will call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. Councilmember Newsom? Aye. Brown? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Brunner? Aye. Calentari Johnson? Aye. Vice Mayor Golder? Aye. New Mayor Keeley? Aye. Motion passes in order. We are on item 28. This is a ministerial design review authority for affordable streamlined ministerial projects with a density bonus. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Just standing up here. Um, good afternoon, Mayor Keeley, members of the City Council. My name is Samantha Hashard. I'm the principal planner for current planning. Um, the item before you right now is a request to update City Council direction to staff regarding the process for ministerial affordable housing projects with a density bonus. So I'll start off by taking you back to 2021, which is when we were processing an SB35 application for uh, a project at 8th Row on Water Street. That was a time when we were just starting to sort of wrap our heads around what SB35 is, how do you process a ministerial permit, how do we apply um, only objective standards? Um, and at the time, SB 35 included this option to have a public oversight meeting before the city council in order to review our um, determinations of consistency with the objective standards. Oh, it's this one. So during that time, uh, oh, we also had a study session. And so we were also using that uh, study session to sort of understand what we could and couldn't do. Um, so it was during that time that council directed staff to um, bring all ministerial affordable housing projects with a density bonus back before the council for review. Um, since then, SB 35 has changed. Um, that was with SB 423. It was amended to eliminate the words public oversight and also to uh, remove the city council review from the equation. So we're just looking for direction, um, uh, updated direction to address that change. 
Um, even though SB 35 isn't currently an option in the city, it could be an option in the future. And we are um, we have been made aware that there may be proposed modifications coming forward to the 831 water project. And so this direction will help us understand how we should be processing those modifications uh, in compliance with state law. Also, since this language, um, I'll go back, since this language is sort of all encompassing, it is not specific to SB 35, it includes other ministerial affordable housing projects that include a density bonus, like those that could come in under AB 2011 or um, SB 2162, that's a streamlining for supportive or transitional housing. Um, and so our uh, recommendation is twofold. One, for the Eighth Realm Water Project potential modifications, we are requesting to review those administratively with the option to refer those to the Planning Commission should there be potential questions about policy interpretation or how we're applying objective standards. And then two, for future requests of ministerial affordable housing projects with a density bonus, we're recommending to have those heard at the zoning administrator public hearing level with an option to refer those to the Planning Commission. And the reason we're um, recommending the public hearing with that second option is because the zoning ordinance currently requires a public hearing to grant a density bonus. So that's something that well, we would have to leave in there. Um, so that's the staff report and uh, Director Butler and I are here for any questions. Well, thank you, Ms. Hester. Mm -hmm. Any questions or comments? from members. Seeing, hearing none, let me see if there are members of the public who are with us in chambers wishing to make comment on the item. Ms. Bush, do we have anyone online with their hand raised? We'll take that person online. Person online, good afternoon and welcome. Good afternoon, this is Ralph Asanenfeld again, this time calling on behalf of uh, Santa Cruz EMB uh, in support of the staff recommendation. Uh, we submitted a comment letter uh, detailing uh, more specifically why why both of these recommended uh, uh, actions are, are good public policy. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Anyone else online, Ms. Bush? Anyone else with us wish to comment? Council Member Watkins is recognized. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I was engaged with the council at the time of this project, and it was very... Um, it was a challenging project. It had a lot of community input, and as a result, specifically for 831, I'd like to make a motion, but I'd like to change the language uh, from the recommendation. So my motion is to conduct the objective design review of revisions to the 831 Water Street project, including potential revisions to the density bonus, bonus approval um, to the Planning Commission. and. That's the first recommendation. And then this, are you ready? Or do you need to so just to confirm, you're just eliminating the administratively with the option to refer. <laughs> Correct, yeah, Re removing the zoning, um, the ministerial. And the second is that any future requests, the second is to remain the same. Um, however, to direct staff that if there are projects of similar scope to also refer those projects directly to the Planning Commission, and that's my motion. Second. Okay, thank There's you. There's a motion and a second. You may open on your motion. Sure, and then I see if you have comments. I just wanted to say, I think, you know, in a time when we're limited in our ability for process and community input, particularly around some of these very large projects that are going up throughout our community, to allow uh, more transparency and more process for community input is, um, is appropriate. And so, specifically for this project, given the level of community interest with 831, but also moving forward with other like projects. So that's the rationale behind the motion. Is there further debate or discussion, Ms. Brown, on the item? Yeah, I would just echo um, Council Member Watkins' comments about this having gone through the uh, initial process, with, which was e extremely challenging, um, and, and add that I think it's, it's particularly important in cases where we see a developer who is, um, you know, in some depending on one's perspective, but certainly mine, and I think at least some others um, <laughs> that I've spoken with, to game the system in order to get out of having to 
have any public you know input or oversight and this particular project I'm surprised to hear is coming back as a modification um, I, I don't want to ask the questions now it doesn't seem relevant to the policy piece but um, I am curious and will follow up about how this would be a modification rather than a new proposal based on what I understand about the project so um, just want to say that I, I think that any and all opportunities for uh, there to be um, public input and for the council and or its planning commissioners to um, have their eyes on this in a public meeting is very important. Thank you, Council Member Watkins. For the debate or discussion, Ms. Bruner on the, on the motion. Thank you. Um, I um, just wanted to comment that I understand um, uh, the motion that's made. However, um, I do agree with the staff recommendation. And um, I think that this is um, for, you know, especially for future projects for affordable housing to be streamlined with a public hearing with the zoning administrator. It still provides that opportunity. And so, I'm not supporting that motion um, with that direct to the Planning Commission, um, but thank you. Thank you. For the debate or discussion, seeing, hearing none, clerk will call the roll. Council members Newsom? Aye. Brown? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Bruner? No. Helen Terry Johnson? Aye. Vice Mayor Golder? Aye. Mayor Keeley? All right, motion passes and so ordered. We are on item 29. This is Climate Resilient Santa Cruz, Graham Hill Water Treatment Plant Facility Improvements, Project Final Environmental Impact Report, and Project Approval. Ms. Luckenbach, welcome. Thank you, Mayor Keeley, members of the City Council, Heidi Luckenbach, Water Director. Today we are bringing to you for consideration is the certification of the final EIR for the Graham Hill Water Treatment Plant facilities improvement plan. Some of these slides are gonna look a little bit familiar to our last meeting with you, but I wanted to reinforce um, the criticality of the Graham Hill treatment plant with respect to our entire water system. Um, as you know, we are entirely locally sourced water, 100%. Uh, we say this, this side of the hill. We have three treatment plants, the Graham Hill water treatment plant and two groundwater treatment plants. The importance here is to note that there are times when we are 100% surface water. So even though we have three different treatment plants, there are times when we only use the Graham Hill Water Treatment Plant. So we rely um, significantly on that as a way of providing water to our customers. I mentioned this last time, but again, I think it's important to remind us that in the 1960s, we constructed all of these facilities, the Loch Lomond Reservoir, um, Felton Diversion, which takes water from the San Lorenzo River to Loch Lomond Reservoir, the Knoll Creek Pipeline, and then the Graham Hill Treatment Plant. Um, and again, just to reiterate, and I think we all know this, we are seeing different climate patterns, weather patterns, and our entire system was planned and constructed in a weather pattern phenomenon that we don't see anymore. So all of the work that we're doing moving forward is really trying to be forward thinking about what we're seeing um, in our current weather patterns, but also being nimble and adaptable to what may lie ahead. Um, I think these are really great photos of the Graham Hill treatment plant when it was constructed in 1968. Doesn't look too terribly different, but for those that have been up at the treatment plant, we have, we're maybe six months away from completing the concrete tanks project. And if you're interested in big construction projects, it's a good time to get head up there. Um, and then 2022. We put out to bid a progressive design bid contract, and this is the first progressive design bill that we've done in the city. You may remember we did a modification to the Muni Code to allow us to contract in this way. We did this in 2021, so we've been under contract with AECOM Lyles. So it's pairing the design engineering team with the construction team to really allow us to design and construct a robust hopefully seamlessly construct a project within schedule and budget. Again, I just want to reiterate the reason for the project is to be responsive to climate change, wildfires. Um, a project that was constructed in the 60s has limitations with respect to the types of water quality that it can treat for. 
And as we know, not just because of wild, wildfires, but also chemicals that we're now seeing in our source waters, we want to have a treatment plant that's responsive to all of that so we can 100% of the time meet or exceed our water quality goals for our customers. Um, I'm going to introdu introduce Ann Sansevera. Ann is with DUDEC, and they have been working on the um, environmental document for the last number of years. She's going to walk through the process, some of the impacts, um, and then what we're asking of you today. Good afternoon, Mayor, Good afternoon. Vice Mayor, and Council members. Ann Sansevera with DUDEC, as uh, Heidi indicated. Um, starting with some CEQA basics, I'm sure you guys are familiar, but CEQA stands for the California Environmental Quality Act, and it applies to projects where there's a discretionary approval like the ones that are before you today. And the purpose of CEQA is to be able to identify and disclose environmental impacts, identify mitigation measures if those are needed to reduce such impacts, have uh, uh, informed public decision making that's transparent, and to uh, also encourage public participation. The EIR that you haven't uh, been referred to in your packet provides a project purpose and need in Chapter 3 as part of the project description. And as Heidi alluded, uh, the purpose is to deliver a treatment plant that's climate resilient and can operate 24-7, 365, and provide reliable and safe drinking water. It's also to address that um, aged infrastructure that she mentioned and to provide facilities that are up to code, both in terms of seismic codes as well as fire and all the others. Um, thirdly, uh, state-of-the-art technology um, operating facility is important to address uh, future water quality con conditions that we know are going to be affected by climate change. And then lastly, to prepare to meet all the future regulations that are coming down the pike. The EIR provides uh, quite a range of project objectives that, if implemented, would actually deliver on that purpose and need and provide the treatment plant that the city is uh, uh, proposing. Let's get into the CEQA process. Uh, we started back uh, after the design uh, builder was on board in June 2022 and released a notice of preparation, which started the, the scoping process for the EIR. Two virtual scoping meetings were held, and then the draft EIR was under preparation for about a year and a half. It was released for a longer than typical uh, public review period. It was 60 days instead of 45, running from beginning of December through the beginning of February of this year. We've been working on the final EIR, responding to comments, um, and the final EIR was released and available in July. In advance of tonight's meeting, um, there were two commission meetings. One, the Planning Commission. Um, they uh, considered staff recommendation on the project entitlements, which are listed in your recommendation, but include special use permit, design permit, a demo permit, um, heritage tree permit, and a slope permit. Um, they recommended, uh, agreed with staff recommendations, and those are included in, in your packet. Um, Water Commission met on August 5th and considered staff recommendation on EIR certification and then overall project approval. So tonight is, uh, actually this afternoon, is the day that you're going to be considering whether or not to certify the EIR and approve the project. And if that happens, uh, staff will um, file a notice of determination, which would complete the process. The EIR uh, evaluated a comprehensive set of uh, environmental topics ranging from aesthetics at the beginning of the alphabet through to wildfire. Most of those topics were determined to have less than significant impacts or no impacts, um, but there were uh, a number that had potentially significant impacts requiring mitigation, um, including biological resources, um, geology and soils, hazards and hazardous materials, and then operational noise. So all of those could be mitigated to a less than significant level with the mitigation measures identified in the final EIR. There was an additional topic, temporary construction noise, that was determined to be significant and unavoidable, both at the project and cumulative level. 
and that was largely due to the need to have some plant shutdowns and to allow for some construction after typical construction hours. Um, so the, the robust construction noise mitigation measure would be applied and would reduce construction noise impact, but not to a less than significant level. And so therefore, uh, overriding considerations statement is included in the findings packet um, that you have in your materials. There were four alternatives that were considered, including the CEQA required no project alternative, an alternative process technology that looked at a different pretreatment technology. There was a reduced capacity alternative that looked at a smaller project in terms of capacity. And then lastly, uh, uh, an alternative that considered no solids dewatering facilities. And so what that would mean is the, the solids from the facility would be relayed through the sewer system to the city's water treatment facility for processing. Um, none of these alternatives would uh, avoid the significant and unavoidable construction noise impact. They wouldn't meet, uh, fully meet the project objectives, and they had uh, feasibility concerns as well. Uh, in terms of comments received on the draft EIR, um, there are a number of comments received. They were all included in the final EIR and responded to in detail in the final EIR. I just want to kind of review those briefly with you. We got a comment um, from the Department of Fish and Wildlife. Um, they had some comments about the standard construction practice included in the EIR for nesting birds. That led to some minor refinements to that practice. They also had a comment about um, the potential for nesting, uh, I'm sorry, uh, bat special status species to be impacted by the project. Um, so regardless of uh, the fact that there was low potential for such species to occur, we, did, we uh, included a new uh, construction practice to address that low potential that, nest, uh, that bats could be uh, impacted. The California Water Resources Control Board had some minor comments about how impervious surfacing was calculated, and those led to some minor refinements in EIR text related to uh, impervious surface area. And then we had three neighbors um, submit comments on the topics uh, listed on, on the slide there. So uh, related to wildlife, I'm sorry, wildfire vulnerability, solar and battery installation, operational noise, um, existing lighting fixtures, uh, treatment chemicals, um, mitigation measures, and then a number of comments that it pertained uh, more to the concrete tanks replacement project. Um, these comments, uh, along with uh, the Cal Green requirements, led to the inclusion of solar PV in the project description as part of the final EIR. So that change was made during the final EIR. Um, there was one additional letter from one of the neighbors that had previously submitted comments um, that was received last week. The comments were uh, of a similar nature to the wildfire vulnerability comments that had been previously submitted, but there was one that kind of fell into a new topic category, and the request from the neighbor was that if PG&E um, facility expansions were needed to serve the project, that those off-site improvements should include undergrounding of overhead uh, utilities. The project does not, in fact, require PG&E expansion off-site, um, so that kind of undergrounding is outside of the scope of the project. And with that, I'll turn it back to Heidi. Thank you. There's a few more wrap-up slides here. Um, I do want to, it's great out, but Anne mentioned that we took this to the Water Commission on August 5th. We've actually reviewed this project in the feasibility stage, the planning phase, design phase with our Water Commission uh, quite frequently over the last three or four years, which is just to say um, it has been under the scrutiny in a public setting, not only the scheduled public meetings, but at many, many Water Commission meetings. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so today we are asking City Council to consider certifying the final EIR approving the project, adoption of the findings of fact, and statement of overriding considerations. And that is in the staff memo. What's next? Um, this is one approval. Because this is a design-build project, we entered into that contract with AECOM Lyles, like I mentioned, for two phases. The first phase is specifically focused on the design. 
Uh, the second bullet there is in fall of this year. I believe it's November. We are anticipating receiving what's called the maximum, the guaranteed maximum price. So that's where we're negotiating with the builder, the price below which they're supposed to deliver the project. Um, we're going to come back to City Council early next year with that price and approving phase two of the project so that we can start construction in summer of next year. Uh, because it came up last time, I just wanted to remind us all that we have a really robust public outreach program we're developing for the three projects listed there, the Graham Hill Water Treatment Plant, Newell Creek Pipeline, and the inner tie between the city of Scotts Valley. Um, these are all items that I've mentioned before, open for other ideas to make sure we get the message out there. The graphic to the right is a weekly email that we send out to neighbors and anybody else who wants to sign up for it, specific to the concrete tanks project, but we'll be doing something similar, if not adding to this one, for when the um, Graham Hill treatment plant begins. And with that, we're happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Ms. Lukenbach. Thank you very much as well for being here. Questions by council members? Question by seeing and hearing none. Is there an, op there's an opportunity for anyone who's with us today to comment on this item? Good afternoon again, sir. Welcome. Hey, uh, everybody. Uh, who here likes bugs? Put your thumb up. No, I'm just kidding. You're politicians. Um, uh, the bat, the CDFW uh, thing about the bat habitat. <laughs> um, the, the reason why uh, bat populations uh, correlate with low infant mortality rates in counties across the United States is because bats eat bugs. They eat bugs. Okay, we're in the Bay Delta region of the C CDFW. Um, and uh, we're one of the only counties in that region that's, you know, coastal, has all these, uh, you know, water, like, well, okay, my point is, uh, my point is that um, um, their concerns are about as important as the city's concerns uh, for its, uh, you know, its, its uh, uh, refurbished water supply. Uh, I don't know, that's exactly what, uh, we're on 29. Yes, sir. Okay, and we're about to vote on it. So the St. George issue that's coming up uh, just in a minute? Yeah. Okay, got it. You got it. Very good. Thank you, sir. Anyone else Anyone else who is with us in chambers wish to make comment? Do we have anyone online? We'll, take, know, yes. we'll take the person online. Good afternoon. Welcome to the council meeting. Person online, three, two, hello. Hear me yeah, we can hear you. Please proceed. Sorry, Thank you. Sorry. Yeah, I had uh, a couple of things I wanted to bring up. One is, um, I just want to, I'm a neighbor, and I just want to say that the water treatment plant has always been a terrific neighbor, uh, albeit um, we had real good history working with them uh, through the years that we've been here, and uh, they're very much appreciated as a neighbor. So my input is all in the spirit of uh, uh, the best outcomes for um, the project. That being said, um, I had two primary comments. One was uh, looking at incorporating uh, the, uh, the infrastructure to allow um, some ground mount and solar and photovoltaics. I know there's a, a small system on the uh, tanks and another small system on the buildings, but I think something a little bigger might be better for uh, water rates and such because it will offset the significant increase in electrical demand that is, this project is going to include. The other input I had was with regards to uh, uh, wildfire and um, looking at addressing some of the uh, fuel loading uh, because the site has as part of this project. I understand that uh, where its specific footprint is, you know, there's not a, a huge impact, but it seems like with the wildfire being as um, big a potential concern as it, it could be, it would make sense to leverage this opportunity to uh, stretch to some of the additional areas um, to address wildfire fuel loading. Anyway, that's all I have. I'm sorry I'm a little bit nervous. I was a little bit hectic uh, getting online here. Um, thank you for listening to my comments. 
Well, thank you very much. You did very well. Don't worry about being, we hope you'll call in again. Don't worry about being nervous. It's all good. We got anyone else online? Anyone else in council chambers on this item? Matters back before the body. Preference of the body. Council Member Watkins. I'll move the recommendation. Motion. Second. Second by Mr. Newsom. Under debate or discussion, Ms. Brown. Yeah, I just want to make a couple of quick comments. Uh, incredible work. <laughs> and I know this has been a long time coming, so want to congratulate you as well for getting a, us to this place. Um, I did want to just point out, uh, I, I don't know if that was Mr. Poppin who, who called in, um, but your, your comments that, that I read were, were extremely informative and helpful. And I, so I just wanted to um, suggest that the, the points you've raised, I think, are, uh, are, are good ones. And while not all of them may be addressed at a very fine level of detail in the EIR, um, these are certainly things we are thinking about and some of the comments in response to your draft EIR comments, I think, um, demonstrate that. So in terms of solar capacity and other things. Um, and it's, but I did want to ask about fuel load reduction and the PG&E issue, not in so far as it relates to this EIR, but in so far as we want to understand what PG&E, or at least I do, um, you know, whether or not that's going to be possible. I mean, I think undergrounding, you know, we all know is what we need to be doing to prevent, you know, to mitigate wildfire risk. Um, and they're only moving so quickly. And, you know, that's a whole other story. But just wondering, is that going to be something that's possible to have a conversation about with PG&E? And I see you shaking your head a little bit. So just, just want to hear a little. Thanks. Yeah, thank you for that question. And I'm shaking my head in appreciation for the question. The conversation with PG&E is ongoing. Um, the city works very closely with them and really only has um, a lot of influence on the sites that we own. Um, but it is an ongoing conversation. With respect to wildfires in general, um, the CZU fire uh, prompted us to do a significant a lot amount of fuel load mitigation at that site. There are some trees that will have to be removed for the project, and they'll only be replaced with fire retardant plantings. And as I believe that was Mr. Poppin on the line, we work very closely with Mr. Poppin over the years and with all the neighbors to make sure our site is as safe as possible and encourage our neighbors to do the same for their site. I wanted to make one other comment with respect to the solar because I think it's an important one as it relates to the city's climate adaptation planning. We do have the concrete tanks that we looked briefly at and the, the Graham Hill treatment plant project does have structures, including the tanks, that will have been designed and constructed to allow for solar panels. And so we have a certain size that we're planning to put on the treatment plant project and the tanks project. And we're also working very closely with Tiffany Weiss West and her group to make sure that the work that we're doing to meet our cap goals as a city, we're investing as efficiently as possible. So once we begin design and construction of that asset, we're going to back up and work with Tiffany to make sure that is there a different technology available or are there different funding sources available. And I say this because I think we have this expectation that all of our constructed assets will be blanketed with solar and that's the way that we're going to meet our cap goals. And I just want to make sure that we're actually thinking very carefully about how we meet those goals. So ground-based solar likely won't happen there. Simply if you've been at the site, there's not a lot of ground space available. Um, but it is being contemplated everywhere else on the site. Thank you so much. Further on the motion? Seeing here none, the clerk will call the roll. <laughs> Council members Newsom? Aye. Brown? Aye. Watkin? Aye. Bruner? Aye. Kalantari Johnson? Aye. Vice Mayor Golder? Aye. Mayor Keelan? Aye. Motion passes and it's ordered. We are on item 30. This is an ordinance extending Assembly Bill 1482 rental increase protections upon expiration of affordable housing rental restrictions. This uh, matter is brought to us by three of our colleagues, Mr. Newsom, Ms. Contar Johnson, and Ms. Brown. Mr. Newsom, please feel free to open on this item. Yes. So I do want to ask there uh, are some uh, residents who are Sorry. There, there are some residents who I think are planning to come down uh, by 3.30, I believe, 
uh, more. I was well, we're not going to be here at 3.30, uh, I suspect. <laughs> okay. But, uh, but I want to make sure. I'm, I want to respect this. The gentleman who has been, I, I, I recognize three gentlemen here who have been deeply involved in this who are your constituents. Are you, I, want to, I don't want to be flippant about this. Are you requesting that we hold this item till 3.30? Is that what you're requesting? No, that's not your re I'm. I'm asking Mr. Newsom. Do you want to continue this item at 3.30 and have us come back then? Um, we can go for it now. Okay, we're going to go for it now. Please open on your item. Thank you, Mayor. Um, <clears throat> so, AB 1482, um, otherwise known as the Tenant Protection Act, was a bill passed by our state legislature in 2019 that, among other things, placed restrictions on an annual rent increase for existing tenancies to 5% plus the percent change in the cost of living or 10%, whichever is lower. Uh, however, there is a loophole in this bill that exempts properties that are categorized as government-assisted housing developments that have expiring affordability rental restrictions from adhering to the rent increase restrictions outlined in 1482 uh, when they set an uh, initial uh, unassisted rate or when they set an initial rental rate after the affordability rental restriction has expired. Now, as a result of this loophole, 71 of my constituents at the St. George residences, most of whom are seniors, some of whom are disabled, uh, they are at the moment facing very steep rent increases of up to 100% or more by November 1. And as a result of that, some are facing displacement and the very real prospect of homelessness. And additionally, uh, it is my understanding that another 122 residents of our city, uh, majority of whom reside in, our dis in my district, could face this very same fate soon due to the rental restrictions in their building expiring at the beginning of next year. Now, the ordinance that is before us today addresses this issue in our community. And particularly, it will do two things. First, this ordinance will put assisted housing developments in our community on the same footing as all other rental properties in our community by closing the loophole in 18, AB 1482 that exempts these properties from the caps on maximum rent increases outlined in this bill. Second, this ordinance will bolster our city's homelessness prevention effort. This is a proactive measure to keep people housed in our community. And if we remember, a few months ago, we were presented with a report on homelessness in our community. And the number one solution cited in that report for addressing this issue was prevention, or preventing people from falling into homelessness. And that is what this ordinance will do. It will allow vital members of our community to remain in their homes and continue contributing to our community, uh, continue contributing to our community. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Other members, wish to open, make any opening comments? Ms. Brown? I think I'll wait until we hear from the residents Certainly. who are here um, and, and then share some thoughts. Very good. Sir, you are recognized. Welcome. Thank you for being here. Thank you. I'm going to take a cue from the mayor and I'm going to eliminate uh, one paragraph where I got kind of emotional and teared up. So uh, I don't want that to happen. So we'll cut that paragraph. Um, mayor Keeley, Vice Mayor Golder. Councilman Newsom, City Attorney Kandati, esteemed council members and staff. My name is Kevin Cummings, and I'm a resident. I've been a resident of St. George Apartments for 31 years. Uh, yesterday, I sent an email outlining most of what I wanted to share today. I have since learned that Green Valley Corporation's legal counsel, William Van Roo, has submitted a 16-page memorandum. And while I've not had the opportunity to read it, I wanted to emphasize that we the residents of St. George don't have the luxury of a legal team crafting such lengthy documents on our behalf, but if we did, I believe our case would be more compelling and more persuasive. Um, I, I would correct one thing uh, Mr. Newsom said. My, my wife and I are, are set to facing a 255% increase, so the average uh, rent increase would be about 100%. It's, uh, what I'm hearing is 60, 80, 100, 150, 200. My next door neighbor is 200. Um, for, yeah, so I'm facing 255%, and that would be a lot of upheaval for my wife and I. Um, but today, uh, in the interest of time, uh, I was going to pass the microphone to our next speaker. We, we did have five speakers planned today. We did have a good show of force. But, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm an ex-basketball junkie, and a win is a win, and I would love to get a win here today, and I'm here today to ask you for your support and to, uh, to codify this solution into law. So uh, we've got 
two other residents here. There probably were about 10 or 15 more that were going to come, but I'd love to pass along good news to them later. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cummings. Others who wish to provide comment, or to, excuse me, I'm sorry. Mine also. We'll, we'll take the first person online. Looks like we're, uh, one, if, if you want to testify, let me just say, if you wish to testify, yeah, go right over here where the gentleman is, and then what we're going to do is alternate. We had one in person, we'll take somebody online, and then we'll be with you in just a moment. Person online, good afternoon, and welcome to the City Council meeting. Good afternoon. This is Ralph Sonnenfeld again, uh, calling in on behalf of Santa Cruz MP in support of the uh, proposed ordinance. You know, we, we don't take... Uh, uh, this sort of, of uh, recommendation lately. Uh, we've done a lot of research and uh, we think that this, this ordinance strikes a good balance of tenant protections and, um, and uh, while still allowing uh, the, uh, uh, the owners of properties affected by this ordinance a reasonable rate of return. Um, one thing I think it's important for folks to understand is uh, the the city is limited in its power to um, uh, enact these sorts of policies on on buildings constructed after 1995. Uh, so this is a very narrow ordinance that only applies to a handful of of um, properties that have expiring affordability covenants uh, that were constructed prior to that. Um, so so this shouldn't impact any future. Con uh, development of, of new housing across the city. In fact, this is only about uh, uh, ensuring that residents of existing buildings are not uh, uh, unfairly um, uh, punished for, for uh, being in the unfortunate situation of being low income and, uh, and having their affordability uh, covenant expire while they still reside in the, in the property. Um, just like uh, uh, most tenants across the state, uh, everyone deserves to have the right to have their rent increases limited to a reasonable amount. And this ordinance would do just that by uh, basically putting uh, putting these uh, residents who are facing uh, extreme rent increases on par with uh, and giving them the exact same protections that everyone else uh, already enjoys. Uh, by closing this loophole in AB 1482. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Welcome. Good afternoon. Hi. My name is Michael Bartlow. Uh, I've lived there for 12 years. Great place to live. It's, uh, we, we really enjoy it. Um, I was not scheduled to speak, so I'll stammer a bit. My situation is pretty typical. Though. I've got an increase of 95.8%, which would take 88% of my fixed income. Uh, one of the speakers here today is a lady, uh, a 69-year-old, I believe, uh, who, uh, with the rent increase, would be paying in rent $500 more than her fixed income. And that's, you know, it's a broad observation, but it's very typical of what you're going to see in all of these things. We're delighted with the sounds of this ordinance, and, and it seems to me the phrase restoring legislative intent is, is what's going to be achieved here, hopefully. Uh, Everybody there loves Santa Cruz. You got a lot of uh, loving people there that love this, the city. Delighted to hear that this is under consideration. And I thank you from all of you. Thank you. thank you very much, sir, for being here. We have another person online. We'll take that person online. Good afternoon. Welcome to the city council meeting. Hi, hello there. Uh, thank you for allowing me to speak today. My name is Anil Babar. I'm calling on behalf of the California Apartment Association. Um, we have only had a limited amount of time to review the ordinance. Our legal team has only had a few days since we weren't made aware of this ordinance in advance. Um, but in that limited time we had to review the ordinance, we've identified a couple of drafting errors that we wanted to highlight. Uh, I reached out to one of the authors of the memo and I've also reached out to um, others to inform them of these concerns. Uh, one being that uh, in section 21720C, you're referencing um, the San Francisco Oakland Hayward CPI. Slow, slow uh, down, if you'd be willing to slow down just a moment. Did you mean 21.07.020? Yes. Okay. 
Please um, proceed. An example of, uh, of that, uh, one of those drafting errors, you, you're citing the use of the San Francisco, Oakland, Hayward area CPI uh, to determine cost of living, but AB 1482 cites that that particular CPI was is only for the counties of Alameda, Contra Costa, Marin, San Francisco, and San Mateo. It, it's just an example uh, of where um, a, a, the error could have been avoided uh, had we had um, more advanced notice and, and ability to review this or this this language. A simple fix to the error that we've noticed is to remove sections B and C because sections B and C essentially uh, restate AB 1482 and don't need to be repeated in, in the ordinance. Um, and it would also avoid confusions and align the ordinance with what Act 1482 actually says. Uh, I think furthermore, our, our larger concerns are when you have properties that have expiring rent restrictions, um, there is an expectation by the owner to uh, that you know they will be able to raise rents to a quote in accordance with market. I think you know future uh, owners will think twice about that if there are limited, um, given the fact that some of these mar rents are far below market. Um, I would encourage you to make those ordinance changes that I cited just for simplicity's sake to make sure the ordinance stays in accordance with 1482. Um, and, uh, you know, we'll be open, we would be happy to answer more questions. Um, and if the city attorney wants to reach out to us, we'll be happy to talk to the city attorney about making any further changes, uh, to make sure the ordinance stays in accordance with state law. Thank you. If you could hold on for just a moment, are you still there, sir? Are you still there? Yes, I am. Good. Uh, this is mayor Keeley. If you could just, I think the reference you were making was to item C in that section, the one that says for purposes, for the purposes of this section, the annual percentage change cost of living shall be measured by the San Francisco, Oakland, Hayward area consumer price index. Did When you said that was a drafting error, did you have a suggestion for a more appropriate index? Mayor, we, we yes. Um, according to AB 1482, if there are no specific CPI sub-index for a particular region. Uh, you would use the general um, C California CPI for all urban consumers. For all, uh, it, it's cited in, in in the language of AB 1482, but you would use this, basically this, the statewide general CPI index for uh, areas such as Santa Cruz. Thank you. I appreciate that clarification. Thank you for your help on that, Councilmember Brown. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I just wanted to respond to that um, sure. so, as quickly as possible. We uh, did receive that communication and have uh, revised the recommendation. We will be revising the recommendation to address the California CPI. Thank you. We'll continue on. Good afternoon, sir. Welcome again. Good to see you. Hi. Um I lived at the St. George for about three years, back in um, 2007, 2006 to about 2000, uh, 2009. Um, I uh, I wholeheartedly uh, uh, support you. Uh, this is, uh, you know, if you if you were to say uh, uh, in some way not uh, not uh, pass this, it would be diluting your interests in uh, uh, creating low income housing. Uh, you know, um, it's in 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 many ways. Um, um, you know what you're uh, what you're uh, being inclusive with these uh, un 71 units was it um, you know it's uh, it's uh, it's just it's just uh, endorsing uh, your prior uh, decisions um, I think uh, yeah the, the St. George uh, uh, the, you know I always kind of felt sorry uh, I was on a program uh, where I was low income and I always felt sorry uh, for the people paying uh, full price because it's really pricey for such a small unit but it's what people have to work with uh, living here, uh, you know, and that's, um, that's important, you know, it's important. Um, uh, anyways, I myself, I'm also an ex-basketball uh, junkie, uh, but I, I'm a current, I'm actually, no, I'm not a warrior. Uh, uh, <laughs> exactly, yes, we should, some of us are still basketball junkies, and not, not even interested in getting over it. Good afternoon and welcome, sir. 
Good afternoon, Council. My name is Eli Holliday. I'm an organizer with COPA, and you guys are moving fast today. We anticipated you would come, that this would come up a little bit later this afternoon. So I've been deputized to stand in for 40 faith institutions across Santa Cruz from AFC and COPA who are all standing in support. We want to congratulate you on your work on this ordinance and just uh, stress that this, you know, we think this ordinance is a huge win, that it closes a loophole, um, and that it'll keep 70 people in their homes effective November 1st. So thank you very much for your work on this. Well, thank you to you and COPA for everything you do in our community. Thank you so much. Another person online. We'll take the person online. Good afternoon. Welcome to the council meeting. Yeah, hi. Yeah, this is Garrett. Well, I'm going to throw a little cold water on this. I, I, I'm just going to read parts of my letter. You know, maybe I've read this one wrong. Maybe not. Maybe the state has it wrong. I mean, or, or it's you. You tell me. But it seems to me I've witnessed many instances where the sacred, time-honored legal principles of our Constitution seem not always to hold any presence or acceptance in your legislative thinking. I'm not a legal scholar, but this is seemingly, or plainly, I'd say, a change the deal in validating the past agreed upon rules uh, related to the expiration of wealth price controls. You tell me, but uh, aren't you then retroactively changing agreements without any agreement by the parties affected? Uh, they expected expiration when they agreed to the projects in the first place, and it's part of those agreements. It seems like another form of an ex post facto law. You know, it's, uh, hey, expiration means expiration. Expiration was the understanding. Again, you're changing the deal. But who can trust agreements with you this way? If so, or anyway, this should only apply to new projects, if at all, with uh, new rental protection agreements containing such subsidized price fixing with the full knowledge of the parties involved and uh, not to project agreements about to expire made in the past, if, if you must. I'd love to hear an explanation how this is justifiably the legal or right thing to do. I'm guessing it's not, even if cities are permitted to make tougher laws than the state. Those must be forward-looking, not backward-looking when it comes to such agreements. One of the dumber ordinances, so just for instance, tougher than the state, was the large rent control ordinance. And how do you figure that worked out, really, when inflation was raging 14% in just two years and the landlords could only raise it 7%? I mean, eventually, that's a problem, right? It's not It's not really sustainable. You know, the only out is if people move. Uh, there is a, a possibility inflation will never go back to the lower levels. And older buildings, you know, at some point they need reinvestment right around the time these rental control expirations occur. If there's no money for that, there's no reinvestment, maybe they just tear it down instead. And then no housing. Uh, th this is not a loophole, but it's an agreement, and people do need to take responsibility for their lives. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Phillip. Anyone else online, Ms. Bush? We'll take the next person online. Person online, good afternoon. Welcome to the City Council meeting. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Council. Three cheers for uh, your uh, adjustment to AB 1482. Uh, close friends with a St. George uh, patron. I uh, help a good man suffering with schizophrenia. I take him shopping weekly. Uh, the greatest joy of his life is a comfortable apartment that he's lived in for over 20 years. He is staring at a fourfold rent increase, which will actually exceed his, uh, his fixed income. Not only the St. George, but the Palomar and others uh, can suffer uh, this same consequence if, uh, if we don't move forward with what uh, you're proposing. I salute you. I know that landlords... Uh, uh, have a, a, a duty and a right to earn an income, but to make a 200% rent increase uh, strikes me as unfair when the rest of our state's renting population are protected by a 5 or 10% rent increase. Why not our friends at the George? Keep up the good work. Uh, veterans uh, are calling out to you for help uh, to think that there might be 70 people standing on the street in front of the St. George looking for a place to live uh, strikes me as horrible. So I pray for your kindness and uh, the shelter to uh, these uh, vulnerable friends of ours. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Ms. Bush. More folks online? Last call. Wish to testify on this item. Matter is back before the body. 
Mr. Newsom. Thank you, Mayor Keeley. I'd like to make a motion to accept the staff recommendation with the following uh, revision. At section 21.07.020, uh, subsection C, that section reads, for the purposes of this section, the annual percentage change in the cost of living shall be defined in accordance with subsection G3 of California Civil Code, section 1947.12. There is a motion. Is there a second? Second. Second by Ms. Brown. Under discussion, you may open, sir. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I first want to thank everyone who spoke today. I also want to sincerely thank my colleagues, Councilmember Colin Tari Johnson and Councilmember Brown for helping me bring this ordinance forward. And I also want to thank the city's attorney's office for all their great uh, work. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, this ordinance will do two things. First, this ordinance will put assisted housing developments in our community on the same footing as all other rental properties in our community by closing the loophole in 1482 that exempts these properties from the caps on maximum rent increases outlined in that bill. And second, this ordinance will bolster our city's homelessness prevention efforts. It is a proactive measure to keep vital members of our community housed and allow them to continue contributing to their neighborhoods and to their community. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Further debate or discussion, the vice mayor is recognized, then we will move our way around. I, I want to thank my colleagues for bringing this ordinance forward. I think in this case, um, it's really important to ensure that the residents of the St. George are not being um, displaced. But I am a little concerned. Um, I'm going to support the, the effort here. But I just want to express my concern that every building does have a usable life. Mm -hmm. And so when we're thinking about these things, it's going to impact you know long-term planning over decades for developers and what this means. And so I'm not sure if the onset, when they got their leases, if they were given notification that in this year you would, you know, be subject to market rate or a significant rate um, increase in your rent. And if so, you know, I think that that's something that we, we it would be important to find out. And um, it just concerns me that, um, we're not, um, if that is the case, but helping residents in those sorts of buildings be on the first wait list for new buildings as they come online, because eventually every building in this town is going to be replaced. That's just how buildings work. And so if somebody is at the end of life of a building, that they should be on the first round for the next building that's going to be built so we aren't pushing people into homelessness unnecessarily. And so I don't know how that would look or how that would work, but I think it's something to consider as we have buildings coming online and buildings that might be coming offline in, in the future. So just some food for thought. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Colin Dari Johnson is recognized. Thank you. I just want to take a moment to um, thank Councilmember Newsom for taking lead on this and Councilmember Brown. I know you both worked um, extensively on this issue and our community partner, Santa Cruz EMB and COPA, um, I do believe this is in alignment with the intention of the state law, and I'm happy to be supporting this. Um, and it's been said that you know if, if we didn't address this loophole, then we would be moving backwards from and all the ex ex extensive resources we're putting into homelessness. We need to also pay attention to preventing homelessness, and this is one of the ways that we do this. And I also just want to acknowledge the. Um, Residents of St. George, I imagine the last several months have been quite challenging for you. So uh, I want to acknowledge that and just thank you all for your patience as we try to figure out the best way forward. And I think this is the best way forward. Councilmember Bruner is recognized. Thank you. Um, thank you uh, to the my colleagues that worked on this. I know last year um, and over the past months, it has become an increasing priority to um, figure out a path forward uh, to support the residents at the St. George. And I won't repeat everything that was already said, but um, this definitely has been um, evident as, you know, aligned with what, what the priorities are and prioritizing tenant protections. And um, I think this is um, strikes that great balance 
um, as we move forward with these types of housing and supporting these residents. Um, so thank you everyone for the work on this and all the um, um, time. There was a lot of research I know that went into this and um, Copa and Yimby and the residents, um, thank you as well. And um, yeah. Council Member Brown is recognized. I won't repeat what my colleagues have already said, but just say that I wholeheartedly agree. Um, I'll repeat a little because I want to give big ups, <laughs> <laughs> real appreciation to Council Member Newsom for your work on this. You really uh, took the lead dove in in a situation where we really all were saying, you know, what are, what can, what are we going to do? We need to do something. And it's been, um, you know, complicated uh, <laughs> and even down to the last moment being able to navigate that, uh, the, the code change in the ordinance. Uh, so just thank you. And to um, Council Member Kalantari Johnson for signing on, to I think all of my colleagues who have, um, you know, been expressed an interest in, in trying to do something. Um, I also want to thank uh, Rafa Sonnenfeld because I think that the a conversation that we had and that I know others have ha had really started to catalyze the potential for this approach and um, as well COPA and I'm going to add the AFC, the um, Association of Faith Communities who have also been involved in this conversation um, and, and talking with the residents. Mostly I want to say to you all, um, I am thrilled to, that we're here today to be able to take a very small step that will have a big impact on your situation. I can't imagine how it's felt to have this kind of ha hanging over you for this time. And so it's a step we can take. It's, um, there's more to be done. And, you know, we're here and want to continue to work with you. And I'm sorry to those who I know that people were really prepared to come and speak today. And that's a big deal. And um, since we're going to end early, that opportunity is being foreclosed. But I, I want you all to feel like your voices are heard. So, um, just really thank everyone and um, keep in touch. We'll we'll keep working with you. Is there further debate or discussion? Uh, a couple of very quick comments. One is a, a thank you to all involved in this. This is quite a good effort. You know, I know that as we move from at large council members to district council members, uh, in the roughly 20 months I've been part of this enterprise here uh, and seeing this conversion from at-large to district, I've noticed that virtually every council member in the last 21 months has demonstrated to the public what district leadership looks like. And Mr. Newsom, this looks like district leadership where there is someone accountable in every district in this city. And when it's at large, and I know there's a debate about this in the city, about which is better, uh, but when everybody's elected at large, you gotta ask questions, is anybody responsible in a particular neighborhood? Just maybe you live there or whatever it might be. But I think this is what district leadership looks like uh, and cooperation among and between district leaders as well. So thank you all very much for that fine work. Clerk will call the roll. Council members Newsom. Aye. Brown. Aye. Watkins. Aye. Bruner. Aye. Colin Tari Johnson? Aye. Vice Mayor Golder? Aye. And Mayor Keeley? Aye. Motion passes and so ordered. Thank you all very, very much. This will almost bring us to the end of our agenda. I'm going to abuse the privilege of the chair to mention that on our portfolio management report, which is about our pooled money investments and how we're doing with that. The only reason I'm going to comment on this is because we are in a changed environment. We used to do all of this internally. We now do a portion of it externally. Uh, we have a uh, hired a firm which does some of our portfolio management. Uh, when you look at that, uh, usually investment managers are interested in a range of issues, safety, liquidity, and yield in that order. and. Uh, Right now, on the question safety and liquidity, there's no messing around with that. You know, there's, there's do's and don'ts in that in the law. On the uh, return on investment, we're now getting 388 basis points 
uh, return on investment. In other words, 3.88%. Uh, I had the privilege of being the county treasurer, but although uh, part of that was during the recession and we were thrilled if we got 20 basis points. Uh, we're not in a recession right now, uh, but 388 basis points or 3.88% is a very responsible return on investment in the context of respecting the uh, notions of safety and liquidity. So I want to thank both our finance department as well as our consultant uh, who is doing uh, the bulk of our investment work these days. Uh, Madam Vice Mayor, I, I'm sorry about this, but we are at the end of the agenda, and you may have to make a motion to adjourn. I can still move. You do. You make a motion to adjourn. Anyone else? Uh, reluctantly, uh, Mr. Newsom, who is kind of the council member of the hour this afternoon, uh, gets the privilege of seconding that we adjourn. That is not a debatable motion. Those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Shockingly, motion passes. We stand adjourned. I got an email that we can <laughs> On your way. I know.